Hello everyone, it's the drinker tonight. Uh, how's everyone in chat doing? I'm joined tonight once again by Gary Nerdrotic. How the hell are you doing, my friend? Oh, so much better after I just finished watching that beautiful film. God, I was I, I I hadn't seen it in a in a couple three years, and I forgot how great it was. I was laughing my ass off. How are you, sir? I am great, man. Yeah, like uh, like yourself, I watched Face Off today just to prep for this stream, and it's been years since I've seen it. Uh, I remember it being a good, fun movie, but I'd forgotten just how much fun. <laughs> and uh, holy shit, man, I got a good laugh out of this one. Um, yeah. It was two hours and fifteen minutes of absolute batshit crazy insanity, and I loved every minute of it. Yes, and uh, it, it's just a reminder of what movies will never be well i can't say that again you know trends tend to swing back around but it's going to be a while until we see like hard fueled testosterone with overacting that is just to a genius level uh and and it also in a weird way made me think of the power of scientology back in the day because um i remember john travolta being a better actor but i guess he really wasn't he was always like this and it's i mean he's bad in a good way in a lot of movies and yeah he was uh it's you know nick cage can overact with genius uh, john travolta's is a different level though it, oh it, he really is he yeah. he's special i mean I, I assume in his younger days he got by on just like good looks and charisma and you know as he got older it, it was weird this he went through this strange phase in like the the late 90s where he started doing action films and he was the most unlikely action star you could think of this like slightly podgy middle-aged man <laughs> you know <Yep. laughs> running around shooting guns kicking ass it's like okay man why not um you know it's funny because i was talking with as um uh, heel versus babyface like uh, a month or so ago when we did our commando stream and you know we were talking about how the the sort of big action icons of the 80s like schwarzenegger and stallone they kind of faded out in the mid 90s um and it was because of movies like this because of movies like face off where you know you started getting more um more of the kind of eastern directors coming in and bringing more like um a different style of action it's much more um uh, sort of energetic it's much more stylized and these big muscle men that you had before just walking around with a machine gun it wasn't enough they wanted something a bit more sophisticated and that's how you ended up with uh, i guess movies or directors like john Wu who came in they kind of changed the landscape of action films and um yeah one of the products of that was was uh, face off and what a movie it was it was and yes and having i mean even nick cage back in the day thinking thinking of him as an action star is a bit crazy if you think of where he started you know kind of as an indie darling and yeah he was kind of an interesting little character actor for quite a long time wasn't he and he would do these quirky kind of roles where he was he was quite intense and crazy and yeah it's like he did the rock i think and that kind of showed people like it, for some reason it gave everyone the impression like oh this guy can be a viable action hero and then he did things like con air and and face off and so on um and yeah it kind of went from there it, yeah it did and and it, it showed uh, i think it makes it more relatable right so that was that evolution we wanted a more artistic action film and we also want a little bit more relatable character even bruce willis uh think you know he's th thought of as an action star now when he started out he was in this like romantic comedy show called moonlighting here in the state oh yeah yeah, yeah. i remember moonlighting <laughs> And yeah, and when when we saw when I saw him in Die Hard, I'm like Bruce Willis in Die Hard because people saw him more as a as a comedian, you know, uh, at the time, and uh, not an action star. And yeah, well, it changed changed everything. So that that was that's part of it. And John Travolta, like back in his early days, was known for Saturday Night Fever and being on Welcome Back, Cotter. And yeah, and I would never thought of him as an action star, but you know, Pulp Fiction changed everything for him and. Um, if I don't know if you're watching the boys or not, they're doing this, uh, subtext or this, uh, this other plot line with the deep where he's getting involved with this cult, which is supposed to be Scientology. And it kind of yes. shows you how, how, uh, th they're presenting how actors could get back in because John Travolta was a huge star. And then he wasn't, he fell from grace for a long time. And then he made this inexplicable comeback. 
uh, which was because of Pulp Fiction, but maybe, maybe just maybe there was a little bit of the power of the church behind that too. You don't know. Uh, but it gave us this blessing, so I'm okay. With nothing, that. yeah, nothing would surprise me about Hollywood and the weird networks of people and stuff and connections. Um, yeah, I am watching um, season two of The Boys. I've been enjoying it so far. I think I'm on episode six at the moment. I, I heard not great things about episode seven, but I'll yeah. wait until I've seen it. Um, it, I think it's going to be a real mixed bag when I come to review it for this season because I recommended The Boys for season one. And I don't want to have to retract that in late of season two, but we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Just think of Westworld. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Oh Christ! Don't don't mention that fucking show, man. Honestly, I'm still having therapy for that. No, um, your video on that was genius, though. I think that was. Yeah. Uh, 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 I think that's that's a uh, a study in and how a show can go wrong so quickly. So and yeah. You could- so well and it, it, it's so annoying as well because season one was great i loved it it was so well constructed it was smart it was brilliantly acted you know scenes with guys like anthony hopkins and ed harris you know acting together it's like god damn this is brilliant to watch with riveting uh, and then when you see what season two and three became it was god it was just like a a woke preaching session yep and uh, everything like uh, post 2016 hollywood yes right now uh now they're stripping off to try and get us to vote i <laughs> uh, no, oh i didn't have time to make a video on that yesterday i, I don't that was horrible i saw your tweet i agree i it i mean this is it's a cry for help it's desperation um and that's where we're at and then yeah and then you know you you watch face off after that you're like where's this hollywood where's the weird scientology uh, you know, doing blow with hookers on yachts, Hollywood. I miss that. I want it to come back. Where, where's Nicholas Cage just grabbing women by the ass? <laughs> 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 I, I was going to say this, like, because uh, just in case I forget later, there's there's an incredible scene that had me laughing out loud where uh, <laughs> it's like Nick, uh, sorry, Castor Troy has become Sean Archer, and he's just um, he's just went ahead and defused this bomb that was going to blow up half of LA because yeah. um, he knows who where the bomb is, and um, he's he's getting congratulated by his coworkers, <laughs> and uh, his secretary comes up and she's like, "Look, the the White House is on line one. It's the president. Um, oh, and your wife is on line two. And without missing a beat, he's like, "Would you tell the president to hold, please?" And she's like, "Okay." And he's just walking by and he grabs her by the ass, <laughs> and you just hear him go, "Ah." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's um, just perfect i was laughing my ass off yes and uh your <laughs> thumbnail for this is uh it's perfect for this movie because that's right at the beginning when uh, he, he we set the tone for everything and uh, oh yeah on his face is like that's nick cage man that's nicholas cage our nicholas I- cage national treasure i i didn't think it was it, it was possible to have that much fun you know, touching someone's ass, but he's proved otherwise. Like he is, he is living his best life in that moment. Uh, I, I, I guess the well, I guess what we normally do with these films is we kind of work our way through. So should we, should we do our best to make sense of this madness? Let's do our best, and I'll, I'll try to stay on topic as much as. Okay. I can. <laughs> Uh, so, as I recall, the movie starts in a fairground, and it's like a flashback to when um, Sean Archer, played by John Travolta, is just out having a lovely day with his son on the carousel and playing with him and stuff, and it all seems delightful. And uh, all of a sudden, Nick Cage and his mighty Tash show up with a sniper rifle and um, and guns him down. Shock horror. And that's the movie over. Sean Archer gets killed, and uh, Nick Cage wins. So it was over in the first 20 seconds. What a Can film. What? Yeah, uh, little boy's dead. Uh, yeah. So they, well, they no, they'll still show that in Hollywood today. They'll still probably kill a little boy. They just did it in Terminator Dark Fate. So they did. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was it was fairly tasteful. I mean, there's not a huge amount of gore or anything like that. But the bullet passes through um, Sean Archer um, and kills his son. So he gets wounded. His son gets killed, and that's where the scene kind of fades out, I guess. So um, it's a, a nice, totally shocking smart. intro. It, yeah, it is just right after the credits. We go right to it. And this movie does not waste a second on. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of chases and stuff we'll talk about. But as far as getting things moving and getting you like drawn in, like you're in <laughs> like immediately. Like, oh, I hate Caster Troy uh, and poor little Hollywood kid. Uh, and this is a, a, a trope that I, I think it's still around. Uh, 
for from the seventies to like the nineties. I don't know if it's a trope, but uh, it, all little kids in Hollywood had these weird bowl haircuts. I never <laughs> had a weird Hollywood kid bowl haircut that nobody had past nineteen seventy eight, but they continued it. Even with yeah. the yeah. I think it's to make them look innocent or something. And yeah, you're exactly right now that you've mentioned that because there's another kid later on in the film who's got like, again, really long 1970s hair for no apparent reason. It's like this movie was okay. It was, it was the late nineties, but it wasn't that long ago. Like styles had changed. Jesus. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's something I've just, it, it's all through the eighties. If you go look through all the little kids, they all have these weird bowl haircuts, unless it's a, like a period piece, you know, like stand by me or something like that. But, uh yeah I, I could think of more nefarious reasons what we won't get into um, oh don't go there <laughs> not in light of the I, you know all the things that come out in hollywood never mind yeah. um yeah so that's that's our intro and it establishes the two characters i guess pretty effectively you know um jo sean archer is the the nice guy who's who's had a family tragedy um because of castor troy who's the evil bad guy who drinks soda while he's uh, gunning people down yes what a stick yep uh, that's perfect though he's so casual about it and he's you know he's just kind of lining up a shot and then they get a close-up on nick cage's lips uh <laughs> you know, sucking on a straw you know you don't even see the soda and, it, and it's in slow motion and it's like it's telling you this is a john woo film and just in case you were wondering uh i'm i'm glad he held off on birds flying behind him as he's sipping the soda but that comes later yeah, we get the birds later in in droves actually, um, but then when we we skip forward six years, I think so. It's six years later, and Sean Archer is now um, a pretty decorated FBI agent who's been heading up a task force that's hunting for Castor Troy, um, and I guess he's on a personal vendetta to try and get this guy, and he's he's been hunting him obsessively for the past six years, uh, and you get this is this is where you know you're watching a John Woo movie because. You know, there's loads of slow motion, like him, like um, taking out his gun and looking at it. And, you know, you get that that kind of um, choir music in the background. Everything's like, yeah, it's all very ominous and heavy and dramatic. And it's right off the bat. That's 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 John Woo to a T. Uh, and he's so brilliant in every way. Uh, yeah. And every, yeah, I love the flying trench coats and and uh, everything about it is uh it's setting up uh a ride that's what this is it's just an absolute ride uh it's it believe me it's not supposed to make sense so i i we were just talking about this i was watching this on amazon prime so they do that little you know the trivia stuff on the left hand side i was reading the hell out of it and <laughs> the whole thing was continuity errors <laughs> i mean just the whole movie there is a i mean i think they got a little nitpicky at points but wow uh, and I don't notice any of this stuff be and it's in slow motion too. I should, uh, but I don't because I'm so into, uh, uh Nick Cage's and John Travolta's performance. Every nothing else can matter uh, after that because I get locked into characters. So I, I don't nitpick too much. Uh, and it's when the characters are bad that I start noticing other things. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's relishing and loving your role. Uh, and Nick Cage really originally didn't want to do this movie. He wanted uh, because he didn't want to play a villain, but then they they sold him like, hey, you're pretty much going to be the hero for most of it. So it, it, he he really gets the shit deal for the most part, actually, because he has to put in all the hard work as the good guy going through shit, and then it's John Travolta who has all the fun as the bad guy for most of the yep. movie, and then he gets to be the guy who lives at the end and you know gets the triumphant return. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Um, I do know that the the lines that he gives later on about like how he, he's so pissed off about being in John Travolta's body, like uh, you know, think about how shit it is for me with this nose and this hair and this ridiculous chin. Um, yeah. He was really um, cagey about giving those lines because he felt like they were mocking him personally. And it's like, yeah, I think John John Woo had to explain to him. It's like, well, no, because you're kind of famous for being quite handsome. So this is like him just. Um, you know, he's just basically an asshole who just resents being you. Yeah. Uh, and then he kind of embraced it then. Of course, freaking actors. <laughs> Are you mm. mocking me right now? Are you mocking me? I think, I, yeah. I think if you're looking for narcissistic actors, you're not going to get much better than Travolta. <laughs> you know? No. no. Um, so, 
Uh, yeah, so he the the setup then I guess is that he's he's kind of an obsessive um, agent who's very driven to to find Castor Troy and and take revenge. And so far he's been unsuccessful, but they seem to be getting quite close to him now because you know all of his task force is working really hard. Um, and I think that's when we skip over to to Castor himself, who's setting a bomb. You don't initially, I guess, know too much about what he's doing, but he's clearly messing around with some kind of big device. Uh, which is explained later, and it's like hidden away in in a convention center. Um, and <laughs> for some reason, he's dressed up as a fucking priest. Yes. Uh, and there's a choir giving a just a demonstration, like they're singing away for no reason. <laughs> and he just like once he finishes setting up this bomb that's on a timer, he, he just goes over and starts dancing the shit out of that. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Nick uh, Cage just flinging his head around. He's having a great time, man. He gets the attention of a a, a, a young blonde uh, woman in the choir, and she drops her little her her lyrics, and he uh, picks them up, and that's where we get your thumbnail. He, he uh, what do you uh, say? Yeah. Uh, well, he's, so he's he's talking about like how he he doesn't particularly care for the Messiah, which is what they're saying, like Hallelujah. Um, but he's like, your voice could make even a hack like Handel seem like a genius, and he like fucking licks the side of her face. <laughs> It's like, oh god, you can't get away with this. And he's in full view of everyone. This is the thing yeah. that's weird about it. Like, there's an entire choir of like 40 people there and the conductor watching them, and he's just doing this while dressed as a priest. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, and yeah, that's when he just grabs her ass and we get that face from the <laughs> thumbnail. <laughs> it's just beautiful. <laughs> Ah, I love Nick Cage, and uh, yeah, I, and I also noticed that uh, all the um the bombs are in these like really you know expensive plastic uh cases that they use in Hollywood to carry around their equipment in. It's always in these like uh, which weren't easy to find back then. Uh, they are now. You can get them in like fries and stuff, but back then they, they they were always in. So they went to the bomb maker and they're like, "Well, make sure we're in these you know these nice equipment cases with." with the foam and everything that that forms around uh, the equipment and it has a cool little skull on it and you're thinking about 1990s technology back then and you're like ah that's so cute it's funny yeah i love how the bomb itself has got porn playing on it yeah. as well like <laughs> <laughs> like when you when he disarms it it's like a woman shaking her tits around yeah. <laughs> Just why not? Fuck it. Just put it in there. That'll do. <laughs> Again, you, you, there's no way a movie like this could have got made nowadays. Not with that kind of content. No. Uh, God bless the 90s. See, I always go back to the 80s as like a great era for action films, but actually the 90s was awesome as well. They were. They were. Uh, and, and you know, I, I, I was even thinking, you know, face off. <clears throat> it's an insane concept and they even mock it in the movie itself uh it's something that was at least uh, i don't know if this was based on something else it was it was original you know it wasn't a sequel it didn't get a sequel uh it was just a one and done <laughs> big bloated action film and god i miss him I just mm. very much so um i i do know that apparently this the original script was going to be much more futuristic that would explain the the sort of ability to swap people's faces and do all this crazy wow. like surgical stuff, uh, but apparently it was John Woo himself who said, "No, I, I want it to be set in the present day. I want it grounded, um, so that I can do like the kind of, you know, make it more relatable, all that sort of thing." And so they rewrote it and just they explained like, "Look, you know, we've just developed this new technology to allow you to do all this crazy stuff, but like it's it's very much set in the present day." Um, and I think that probably helped because I wouldn't want to see them going around with ray guns or something shooting at each yeah. other. This is much better. Oh, no. And he wouldn't have been able to get his boat chase properly anyway. So that's that's always good. Yeah. John Travolta, like, attacking Nick Cage with an anchor. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. So we figure out then, um, or at least at this point in the movie, um, Castor Troy has set some kind of explosive device in this this convention center. We're not quite sure why, uh, but it's on a timer, um, and John Travolta is hunting for him. So um, they get a lead on him that uh, his brother has paid for a private jet to fly them out of LA, um, I guess just to provide an easy way to, to track him. 
Um, it was weird, though, because they were like, oh, guess who just paid for this jet in cash? And it was like, it's Pollux Troy, his brother. It's yeah. like, well, if you paid for it in cash, then why would it be traceable? Like, yeah, surely it would be like if you paid it by credit card or something, then, okay, his name would be on it. Unless Never maybe just recognized them at the airport. They don't talk about things like that. Like you just yeah, things don't have to make sense. <laughs> the motivation for the bomb in LA. Uh they were paid. They 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 mentioned we'll get to that. They were paid, but you don't really know who paid them or why. Yeah, it was just like some weird militia from somewhere. Yep. Like it, it's a strange sort of self-contained world that you get within this movie where like the, the larger world and like, you know, other parts of the country or whatever, they're kind of irrelevant. It's just like this small group of characters within this, this setting. Um, not that it's bad. It just keeps it really focused. I suppose it does. It does. And none of <clears throat> uh, it's just a personal vendetta. We don't need to know anything else. Bad people are out there continuing to do bad things. And it's just about these two. And there, and 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 that it, it honestly just the the revenge story of of the kid dying, and you know, and then what happens, the disaster that happens after that. Uh, yep. So yeah, Nick, uh, Nick Cage rocks. Or sorry, I'm, I'm going to call him by his character name. I shouldn't keep saying Nick Cage Don Travolta because it's going to get really confusing later. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Castor Troy rocks up at the airport um, to meet his brother, um, so they can fly out of there, and he's he. Again, the John Woo sort of um, stylized entrance, like he gets out of the car, it's all slow motion, he's wearing this big trench coat that's billowing behind him, it looks cool as fuck. Yep. Um, he's got like two gold-plated Colt 45 handguns, which just look awesome. They are so cool. Dude, I want them. I want yeah. I, I love his little case with the chicolets and the, the joints and the pills and uh, the, the big freaking gold money clip and yeah and they, they they treat it with such reverence you know again it's slow motion and they handle it like it's like it's like it's something precious or whatever and it's yeah and and a good billowing trench coat like that was a staple of my teenage years is a good bill yeah coat. that that was a 90s thing for sure um it was a weird thing about it. there was a bunch of stuff that you see in action movies a lot in the mid to late 90s um trench coats sunglasses indoors and techno music you would yep. see that shit a lot in action movies. It was awesome. It was. I'm wearing my so, now. Uh, so yeah, you, you, his brother Pollux is kind of um, this computer nerd who kind of designed the bomb, but he's like a bit neurotic and weird and, and kind of, uh, you know, I don't know if he's meant to be on the spectrum or something like that, but yeah, he's clearly got issues. Yeah. Um, and, and, I, Nick, what, and, and I thought it was Rob Moreau for the longest time when I was back in the day when I was watching this, but no, it's Alessandro Nivola. So, but yes. he, he does a very good job being the weird, uh, yeah, Asperger's brother, uh, who's the one weak point for Castor Troy, like the one actual thing he cares about. Cause other than that, he doesn't, you know, he's a yeah. complete monster. And it's good because it, it figures into this this theme of like revenge and stuff and the, the rivalry that they have that, you know, he loses his brother later on and it gives him a really strong personal vendetta against um, against Sean Archer. Yep. So, you know, the two of them have each lost someone because of the other one. Um, and it's like, yeah, it's it's quite an interesting dynamic it creates, but I guess we'll get to that shortly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they, they get on the plane to, to leave and there's a, there's a air hostess there who's um you know ready to serve them and for some reason she just gives um caster a drink like without even knowing what he wants or anything <laughs> he just gives him a drink of whiskey or whatever and he's like oh yeah cool um and yeah nick cage goes into nick cage mode again and he's like yeah if i was to let you suck my tongue would you be grateful <laughs> <laughs> straight in there son good going and she does like the good uh <clears throat> agent she is uh yeah uh, that was, uh, you know, he's all sit down, lady. Uh, yeah, yeah right was, on my lap here, right on my lap, right on daddy's lap. <laughs> and it had to be something like pretty disgusting. I'm wondering if that stuff was ad libbed. You never know. You never with know. Nick Cage, nothing would surprise me, honestly. Um, yeah, I, I could see him doing that. And it's it's funny as well because, like, in the next scene, they're they're 
taxiing down the runway, and that's when all the, um, you know, the the police cars like sweep in with um, with Sean Archer leading the charge because they've they've obviously tracked him down to this airport and they're going to intercept him, and they get a shout from the the cockpit that the the police have arrived, and he's in the middle of like unbuttoning or or blouse or something <laughs> like, and he's just going to do it right there in front of his brother and like his two henchmen. Yeah, I just love that I'm on like a perv. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was very, and, and I love Archer like shows up in his Hummer, right? There's a bunch of Hummers and police cars and, and then a helicopter shows up and it's it just balls to the wall from the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's great. And they, um, they're almost playing chicken with each other. Like the hum, the Hummers driving straight towards the jet, the jet's about to take off. Um, and you know, Sean's, uh, you know, he's, he doesn't care about the danger he's putting himself in. Yep. And I think you, you get that straight away from him because his friends like, don't play chicken with a, with a jet, you know, you're going to get us killed. And he's like, yeah, come on. I don't give a shit. Um, and it's only when he sees that, uh, you know, this, this air hostess, she's actually like an FBI undercover agent. Cause she tries to pull a gun on caster, um, and gets knocked out. And he like drags her up into the cockpit with a gun at her head. And he's like, Oh shit, he's, uh, he's got a hostage. And that causes him to pull aside, you know, so the jet can go by. Um, and <laughs> that's when uh, he's he's chasing after this jet, and um, you know, Caster Troy just opens the hatch, and he's like, "Oh, is this one of your people, Sean?" And then just shoots her dead and throws her out the hatch. Yeah, and he just gives this little shrug, like, "Nah, what can you do?" Yeah, <laughs> <You know? laughs> yep, like that's it. And by the way. Uh, this is the longest runway of all time because it, it's tied. It's definitely tied with the Fast and the Furious. Like I think yeah. Fast and Furious Six or something, where there's a runway that goes on for about eight miles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because in all this time, like the, the jets taxiing along pretty fast. Like they're they're having all this chicken uh, thing. Then he turns around. He's chasing her. She gets thrown out. Um, he has to stop and then get into a chopper so that he can chase after it again. And it still hasn't taken off. So yeah, that is that is a big ass runway. Yes, and uh, so after uh, the the agent gets killed and Archer backs off, I mean, you could have kept the agent alive and probably taken off that way, but why not? And uh, then yeah, they have time for Archer to get out of his car and run into a helicopter, get the pilot out of the helicopter, take the helicopter off, and the plane is still taken off on the runway while they do that, and the helicopter just catches up. Yeah, it's <laughs> great. Because I think there's one point where Castor goes up into the cockpit and he just says to the pilot, "Like, what the fuck are you doing?" <laughs> like he's just wasting yep. time. Um, but yeah, so somehow he's able to like land the chopper on the the tail uh, and damages the ailerons so it can't take off properly, and then he shoots out one of the engines so it's it's um, damaged um, and. The, the pilot's like, oh, we can't take off. There's a fire in the engine. And like Castor's reaction is just like, <laughs> and shoots him, just shoots him in the head without any hesitation. It's like, it's just a mild inconvenience for him. Um, <laughs> so and, yeah. And then the, 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 I guess like he tries to take control of the jet himself and it veers off the runway and straight into a hangar. And it's such a cool scene to watch because if this was done nowadays, it would all be CGI and stuff. And like, this is real. Like the, the jet flies straight into it. Shit explodes everywhere for no reason because it's a John Woo movie. Yep. Um, like sparks are flying. There's debris. There's glass everywhere. It's cool as fuck to watch. It is. I mean, the actual plane doesn't blow up but everything else does. And it, yeah, barrels and stuff, they just get knocked over and explode for no reason. <laughs> like, yep. uh, yeah, I knew we shouldn't have stored our nitroglycerin here. Yeah. The, the <laughs> oh, yeah. Next time, maybe underground. Uh, not in the hangar where, where planes can come by. And I love that there's two guys like just standing in front of the building. I don't know if you noticed that. And then Yeah. They they're laugh. not even doing anything. They're just there. <laughs> in there <laughs> looking at the building They're like you just look at the building and when the plane gets close we'll tell you it's all right yeah <laughs> we just need you to like run to the side you know like yeah, dramatic yeah. fashion yeah um so with the plane disabled like the um you know the fbi swarm in and that's when uh old castor gets his twin pistols out and starts gunning people down and he's like he is effective you know he's leaping through the air in slow motion, just firing, and he takes out like three agents just doing that. 
Yeah. Like, Holy while he's shit. In this, good, this guy's a good shot. Yes, he is. And the cops are horrifically bad shots. And they're dumb as hell, too. How about all the ones that are just getting killed left and right? You know, like, okay, so the plane crashes in and um, and Troy gets out, leaps out, does what you just said, shoots three, three cops in the air and archers behind him. And he's and then he like he blows all, a couple of cops cover. He goes, get down. And then as soon as he says, says that Troy or somebody turns around and shoots the cop. Right? Yeah, it's later on when he's they're in a hangar and he's like, Berkeley. And this guy who was in the midst of tracking <laughs> Castor turns around like, what the fuck? And then Castor just shoots him in the back. <laughs> dude killed you dumbass and yeah <laughs> he's like, uh, he looks at him and goes ah oh well uh well i'll talk to his wife later and uh yeah they just yeah there's this just big long gunfight in the hangar and with the brother and uh and troy and if like cops get killed left and right um and margaret cho is in this for some reason she plays a cop in something else oh bright she plays a cop at bright too i guess she gets cast like that a lot and she she hates cops actually but it's funny ironic um and yeah they have this big long fight and then of course it's almost it feels like the end of a movie like it, it feels like the finale of a john woo movie where it's still in the first you know 15 minutes here and, and we end up uh with a one-on-one -on -one between archer and troy and there's some engine this hangar also besides you know storing nitroglycerin it oh there's there's so <laughs> much shit that happens that has no explanation like you know suddenly caster is like up on a balcony above archer and i have no idea how he got up there or anything but he shoots down at him then he's then he slides down the side of an aircraft wing that's like 45 degree angle and he's firing and he kills another agent and then they're shooting at each other and then another guy gets killed in the crossfire and his gun hits like a, a control panel that starts up a jet engine <laughs> like i was just sitting watching it like what the fuck is happening i know and i'm like i don't remember the warehouse being this big uh, oh yeah yeah it's a big yeah. place now like it grew <laughs> and i just love there's a jet engine just sat there just hooked up ready to go um <laughs> why don't know just there um and yeah so it's it's fired up and they're stood next to it and i think um you know they, they've they've got each other in kind of a, a standoff because they both got one bullet left apparently in their guns and you know they're they're they've got each other at gunpoint um and caster troy is just kind of mocking sean um and saying you know you're not having any fun are you sean and yep. he, then he just tries to shoot him but his gun's empty or it's jammed or something he's like oh fuck he gets down on his knees and he's <laughs> he's like i'm scared shawnee yep. <laughs> as he's pulling out his knife yeah it's like he's obviously just trying to stall him uh, while he tries to you know he gets a knife out and tries to swipe at sean and he just kicks him right into the path of this jet engine and kicks it up into to full throttle which i'm pretty sure would incinerate you but it just kind of throws him backwards which is weird um and he just he, he just goes flying down this like exhaust tunnel and hits the the grating at the end of it uh, and that's him out of the picture yeah he's supposed to be dead uh yeah. at that point and that's it uh end of movie yeah <laughs> it's like that would be you could pretty much have a movie like that and that's just it it's like that's more action than you get in in a lot of half decent action films now you know oh so in the first 15 minutes there is more left behind in this movie that is filled with everything than in most action movies you can you're right you can make another movie about the uh, what led up to this don't i'm not i don't want to give hollywood any ideas but um well they can always do a uh, face off with female leads uh we can always look forward to that uh but uh yeah they, they, that's it and then uh what is it what happens next they um they end up uh, was are they at the office next god i just watched this movie and this is yes you do um that. Yeah, so he's he's apparently been killed, and that seems to be the job done. And so he's, um, I don't know if he goes home first uh, and talks to his wife. Yeah, I think he does actually. So he, yes. he goes home, and that's when we get to meet his wife and his daughter. His daughter has been suspended from school because she dresses like a fucking freak uh, and got into a fight because of it and stuff. And um, you know, you get this picture that like. Sh he doesn't really understand her anymore because he's been such an absent father for the past few years and he's been so obsessive. His wife's kind of, you know, she can't really be arsed with him because it's like, um, I guess he's not really a committed husband. 
Um, and that's when he, he reveals that he got um, Castor Troy. He managed to kill him or yeah. capture him or whatever. Um, and that's when you get a little bit of um, reconciliation between them. Yeah, he says, I'm done. Like, this is it. I'll get a desk job. Uh, I'll go to counseling. I'll do whatever I need to do. Uh, and that's it. And I love that the the big freaky thing that the daughter does is has some weird eyeliner. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was the nineties, man. That was that yep. was extreme back then. Um, yeah. yeah, she's. Yeah. Uh, I, I I hesitate to say anything because I don't know how she old, old she was in this movie. I assume she was over eighteen, but uh, man, she was beautiful. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, there's a well. We'll get to that. We'll just yeah. There's that. a great scene later. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anyway yeah like you say he he then goes back to the office um i guess it's the following day or something and everyone's celebrating because it's like yeah we got him um and he's very much you know subdued because he's like well we lost about like a dozen people in the process so we shouldn't really be celebrating here yeah um you know and he, he's yeah yeah he, he seems like just weary as a man like he's I guess this has been the thing that's been driving him for the past six years and now it's done and he's, he's maybe facing up to life without such a purpose anymore. And he just looks exhausted, you know, yeah, empty, you know, figuring out that, Oh, it didn't fill that hole after all. And he's looking at a lifetime of, yeah, like you said, no purpose and uh, a, a family life that, you know, that was still there. And, you know, at least they put this in that he had just, you know, sacrificed for this uh, vendetta. And then something else pops up. Yeah. So then someone from like special ops, I think, comes in and they're like, look, we, we recovered this disc from from the wreckage of the jet. And remember, kids, when when information used to be stored on discs. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. that definitely a 90s movie. This. Yes. Um, so he puts the disc into the disc drive on his PC. <laughs> <laughs> like I really have to lay this one out, um, and it, it just starts playing like uh, an animation of like a, a naked woman. Like um, I don't know why, but like Pollux Troy must have felt the need to program that. Um, and then we get to see the designs for this bomb that he's built. So this is like a bomb that's got enough explosives in it to like flatten half a half a mile in every direction, and it's got nerve gas and everything. So if this thing goes off, it's going to kill like tens of thousands of people, and it's somewhere in the city but they don't know where so this is this is where we find out the the thing that drives the rest of the plot i guess yeah um, so there's so they're saying to him like um you know this this is a threat that uh, that castor troy has set um and the only way to stop it is we're, we're gonna have to get the information from his brother but his brother is pollux sorry um his brother is paranoid and he's not going to tell anyone anything it doesn't matter what you do to him um the only way to to get this information is if we surgically alter you to look like Castor Troy. We're gonna we're gonna take his face off and put it on you. Um, and he's like, "What the fuck are you even talking about? This is ludicrous." So they, that's when they take him out to the big institute. That's uh, you know this guy who's like this medical genius, the 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 Walsh Institute, um, and he's got like the most advanced surgery stuff in the world. Um, and he's he explains how they can take the the face off Castor Troy, who's not dead. He's just in a coma, apparently. Um, and no reason to guard him or restrain him, by the way. He's just there on his bed. That's not going to be relevant later in any way. Yeah, I mean, he's just in a... Yeah, that coma is permanent. He's a vegetable. Uh, nothing to worry about. They even put a cigarette out on his arm yep. uh, to show you. And yeah, they half-ass like... Archer, you know, kind of resists this and, you know, he's all find another way. And then it shows him questioning a couple of people and they kind of half ass it. And uh, but then, you know, they realize they have to do the face off thing because it's in the script. Uh, it's, and the it's purely. Yeah, it's purely just to introduce the other characters as well. Yep. Um, so you've got Dietrich, who's like, uh, well, Sasha, should I say, who's like the girlfriend of Castor Troy. Um, and, you know, Gina she's got a, a kid. And even when Sean Archer threatens to have the kid taken away, she's like, look, I don't know anything. And he's like, fuck. Um, and there's Dietrich, who's her brother, who's like an associate of Castor Troy. And he Nick threatens Cassavetes. him. Played by Nick Cassavetes. Uh, yeah, where have I seen that dude before? Oh, Nick Cassavetes. I'm pretty sure that is the guy who directed... Um, oh, it's that super 
duper romantic movie that everybody talks about the it, it, notebook yes he directed the notebook but his dad also was uh i believe a uh john cassavetes yeah his dad was uh uh, uh an action i think director or i can't remember director or actor but uh yeah he's second generation hollywood and he looks like uh, you know your atypical drug dealer uh he's a big dude he's a real big dude uh, yeah, he's big. He's mean looking. He's got the bald head and stuff. So yeah, he's pretty cool. And he directed. I, I like that. I like the character. And what's yeah. interesting about him is, I, I guess we'll get into this later. But you actually get to see a more compassionate side of both him and um, what the fuck's her name? Is Gina Gersher that plays her? Yeah. Oh, I'll check. Sasha. I'll check. Sasha. Yeah. And and no, this is what makes the movie good is you're right is they give actual context to these other characters right that are they're going to come up later uh and they feel real enough uh something you're not used to in in your atypical action movie uh there's always like the damsel right but this is something a little different i thought and that's what kind of gave this movie a little extra for me anyway yeah oh i think it's interesting because as this, the story progresses like each man learns more about the other man's life and there's like there's kind of more complexity to their lives than they realized and it's yeah uh, we'll, we'll talk about it more i guess when we get yeah. to it but it, it's quite a, a quite yeah. a good balance i think the script provides which i really like a little bit of complexity there um but yeah so we inter we're introduced to these characters but sean's not able to get anything from them meaningful so he realizes the only option is to go through this face transplant surgery um and so they do they do it and uh it, it what the fuck can i even say about this man um <laughs> they they do their best to sell it i guess to you that it's a real thing that could happen uh-huh <laughs> they show the ear first right so like one of the agents got his ear shot off yeah so they show that that can happen and you can use lasers apparently to, to bond human flesh and, and reattach things oh, fuck it, i don't know um i think this is where the sci-fi elements come in that probably would have this this would have been more believable if it had been set like 100 years in the future when you can do all this stuff but yeah okay whatever it's just a plot device um so what do they do they they, they take his face off they, yeah. they swap them over they put john travolta's face in in a big tub of liquid <laughs> because you know they, why they explain the body because there's a huge difference in body i mean like nick cage is in shape and john yes. is not so they mention that briefly they go well we're gonna get rid of those love handles so it's not just a face off it's it's we're gonna mold your body to look the same too um, yeah and we're gonna like change your your hair so like you've yeah. you've got the kind of you know receding hairline of nick cage and all that sort of stuff so i guess they do they do everything so it's like okay i'll just have to buy into this idea i just think i love the fact that when they take their faces off you actually hear a yep like oh. as, it, <laughs> as it comes off it's like i'm no doctor right but i'm pretty sure faces just can't be removed that easily like yeah. no they, they put them on like a mask too when they put back on you notice they rubbed the other like they take the time to show the uh two hands like molding the face around the skull and rubbing it a little bit and you know taking yeah. up and then back and it's just like oh god <laughs> it's, uh, yeah um it, it, i think they'd reached the limits of what they could do with prosthetics and stuff um in that instance <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so we'll keep this in mind right so castor troy is in a coma still so they've removed his face and they've put it on on um you know sean archer um and they've taken sean archer's face and just plopped it in a tank of liquid um just on standby so when he yep. when he's done he can get it back again um because you know it, it's not going to decompose or anything you know i'm sure it'll be fine um anyway <laughs> so the, oh, <laughs> and the voice thing is my favorite because we do all the high-tech stuff <laughs> and then they yeah the operation is a success and then he, he gets his his mask off and stuff um and he loses his shit when he sees his reflection in the mirror which i think is is good like it's a it's an yeah. understandable reaction because it would mess with your head quite a bit when you see your reflection and it's not you anymore um but they they once he eventually calms down he's like well i still sound like me what what, what about my voice um and so they they explain that they've implanted a microchip in his throat just, just a microchip, <laughs> <laughs> microchip. <laughs> just a chip it just does whatever it needs to do yep. um but they, they they're just like look say say a couple of words and then it, it scans a few times so that they can have his voice like nick cage now there is 
there is one thing I did appreciate about this film in that John Travolta and Nick Cage start mimicking each other's acting styles, mm -hmm. which is actually quite good. Like, uh, you know, John Travolta does that thing where he like elongates the things, you know, the way Nick Cage does it. And uh, yeah. Nick Cage does that kind of stuttery, like high energy kind of delivery that John Travolta has. So they do sort of mimic each other in that way. It's quite cool. It's quite clever. It is. It is. And it works. It, and it actually, it, things get much better. I mean, I'm not saying it's bad, but the acting gets better when they reverse their roles. Like, uh, when, when, uh, when, when Archer becomes Troy, that's, that, oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's you know, better. John Travolta just has the time of his life playing Castor Troy in this. It's, it's great fun. Um, yes. but anyway, so, <laughs> So with the operation complete, he's sent into uh, undercover because he's going to go to the same prison as as Pollux Troy, so that he can hook up with them and uh, and and figure out where the location of this bomb is. That's his that's his mission, and very few people know about it. Only the surgical team and the the special ops woman and like his best friend Tito. They're the only people that know about it. Yep. So, sure, sure hope nothing happens to them. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> right? No, and uh, if you recognize the doctor, that that guy is uh he's in everything, man. Uh he is yes. Hargreaves in um Umbrella Academy and uh, He's not changed much either. That's the weird thing. No. Not really. One of those guys who maybe he's a vampire. He doesn't age. He was also in uh The Chronicles of Riddick. He was the necromonger Lord Marshall. Yes. Yeah. And he was in Thor. Um, God, he was in some bad Stephen King adaptation that was uh, went straight to TV. Uh, Storm of the Century. Played oh, Thor. yeah. Yeah. I like that movie, actually. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll say that. I quite liked it. TV, but uh, yeah, it, I remember watching it. Uh, it was when, uh, it, uh, it, yeah, they went through it was their little phase of Stephen King movies or Stephen King books being adapted for TV. And they did that yeah. stand, stand too. That was pretty good. Colm Fior, that's his name. Someone in chat's yeah, pointed yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, just to let everyone in chat know by the way obviously we'll, we'll get through all the super chats and everything but we as always we tend to do that towards the end once we've covered the movie because otherwise we'll have to stop every two minutes as one comes in um so we're, we're not you. ignoring you don't that, worry yeah. hi chat how's it going yeah hail chat hail chat uh so um what has he done so he's in prison right and he's he's taken to this place and they're all given magnetic boots just because <laughs> Like I guess that's the how they keep the prisoners under control. They've got these giant clunky like Frankenstein monster boots on where they have to walk around in them all the time and um you know they can be magnetized to the floor so if they want to stop people from moving around that's how they do it. That's why it's so hard to escape from this place. Um probably make showers interesting. Yeah, I just yeah. I mean do you ever get to take them off? Yeah. Like they what if don't. you get like athlete's foot or something, I don't know. Yeah. Wow, yeah. Was, anyway, uh, yeah. No, they said the only time they get taken off is when, and we'll get there. There's only one time they get taken off. Yeah, when you get fried. <laughs> uh, so he's going through. Um, you know, he's he's released into general population. He finds his brother, um, but before he can even talk to him, he gets he gets ambushed by um, a Russian dude new, uh, named Dubov, who just starts beating the shit out of him for no apparent reason, um, and he has to fight back, and. Yeah, he gets his ass beat initially, doesn't he? Because he's like he's completely like disoriented and he's not used to being in this kind of situation. And it's not until he's knocked to the floor and he kind of makes con eye contact with his brother uh, that he does the patented like Caster Troy smile. Yep. And I just love when he does that. There's a guitar riff that goes off. Yes. <laughs> like, <"Ew!"> <laughs> <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> so good. And yeah, then he starts beating the shit out of that guy and uh, yep. the guards are looking on uh and there's a bunch of actors that we all recognize i mean tom jane is in this scene uh freaking tom jane was in this movie i completely forgot about oh that's i awesome. genuinely didn't know that until years later when someone told me i was like fuck i like when you put the glasses on him and he's got long hair like it doesn't look like him at all no. it's really odd no, it really is it, and it's it's brilliant i that, i love i think he's one of my favorite actors uh that guy is He's so good in the expanse and uh as the Punisher. I loved him as the Punisher. He was yeah. good as the Punisher. Sadly, he was in The Predator. 
I'm yeah. sorry, Thomas Jane, that you had to be in that movie. Please don't be in any other Predator movies. Yeah, I didn't even watch. I, I heard what you and uh, Mahler said about it, and I'm like, nope. And I love, that's my, you know, I like the Predator more, and I like Aliens or anything else. That's my jam, but uh, glad I missed that one. It's glad just a disastrous nightmare of a film, um, and I was glad to put it behind me. Yeah, so... Um, they are in there beating the shit out of each other and the fight gets broken up. And then the guard says, you know, Hey, we end the fights here. Uh, and then Archer or, or uh, Archer as Troy, uh, says, I'm going to get you fired when I get out of here. And they all, yeah, laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like, it's, it, you know, not the kind of thing you would expect from a hardened criminal. It's like, I'm going to have you fired. And then yep. everyone has a, has a good chuckle at that. Um, and is that when we skip over back to um, Caster Troy, who's in his his um, hospital bed, or is there something else that happens after that? I'm gonna check. I've, I'm kind of keeping track. I've got the movie up right here, and hang on, I'm almost yeah. We get right to there, so it gets right to it. So after that, they break up the fight, and we are in the hospital room with caster troy and all of a sudden his heart just starts beating really fast and then back to normal he pops up and um takes his mask off and does this nicholas cage scream which is oh uh, yeah it's it's kind of weird like how he does it it's kind of unsettling uh, horrific you know because like he's got no lips <laughs> yeah he, yeah which is good he plays with that a little bit and next thing you know like uh his henchman bring the doctor in and he gives a little speech. He's all, Hey, I hope you don't mind. I uh, took <laughs> the pain pills there, buddy. Yeah. yeah. And he's like watching a video of the operation is like, ha, ah, bravo, bra fucking vote. <laughs> yeah. This is brilliant stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's such a good scene. And, uh, <clears throat> he persuades the doctor to, um, uh, take care yeah, put his, put another face on and you get a, there's a great reflection because you don't you see like little bits of casters well lack of a face from the side and then you get a good shot in the doctor's glasses mm. of uh you know caster troy smoking a cigarette high as fuck on pain medication and there's his face in uh the doctor's uh left eye it's brilliant it's such a good shot so yeah it's when the doctor says like what what do you want? And yeah, his his face comes into or his lack of a face comes into reflection, and he's like, "Take one goddamn guess." Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you can assume, yeah, he's 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 going to get himself a new face. Uh, meanwhile, in the prison, um, Sean is able to approach Pollux and um, get the information out of him that he needs. He kind of cons him into giving up the location of the bomb at the LA Convention Center apparently so as soon as he gets what he needs off him he's like yeah fuck you you little shit I'm out of here um, and I guess he's uh, he's requested to speak to someone in authority so that he can give over the location and he's brought into like a, a room where he thinks he's going to meet with, um, with Tito or whoever it might be um, and in walks himself yep. or should I say like uh, Caster Troy wearing his face and it's a great little slow motion scene when the door opens and there's John Travolta just reading the newspaper casually. Um, and the camera is just on Nick Cage. And he doesn't like, you know, he doesn't like clasp his mouth or go like, oh, my God. He just like he kind of looks down like, no, I don't understand what's happening right now. Yep. And uh, remember that they the technology had been advanced so much that it only takes them days to heal. Not yes. much. And, uh, so it, it could have been just a couple of days since it happened and yeah, there, he screwed. Yep. Because, uh, that's, yeah. That's when he finds out that, um, all the people who were left, the doctor Tito and that, oh, the other lady, uh, who was heading the whole program, uh, yes. were set on fire where, uh, he took care of all of that. So nobody knows. Uh, that he's there. Nobody knows that they switch faces and uh, Archer is uh, is a new man. Yep. Um, someone's saying the, the classic line here, automatic uh, comment. It, it's like looking in a mirror, only not. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> Great. Great line. Um, yeah. And he's like, <laughs> I, I love how to, 
Travolta hams it up here because he's like, uh, you know, I've I've uh, torched the entire institute and killed everyone who knew about your mission. So, gosh, it looks like you're going to be in here for the next hundred years. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> he's just having a great old time. Brilliant. Yep. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he's like, uh, he's uh, saying like, well, I, I've got to go. You know, I've got a government job to abuse and a, and, and a lonely wife to fuck. Yep. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> he's just having a great time. Uh, yeah. And, you know, Nick Cage grab, grabs him, tries to strangle him, uh, but the guards come in and interrupt it and, uh, and you know, knock him to the ground and stun him. So he's, he's screwed now. And, um, you know, Caster Troy just goes on his way like uh, completely unimpeded and he arranges for his brother to be released from jail because you know he's going to turn in state's evidence or at least that's what he says so that he can get him out of there so um yeah and then uh then archer uh as uh, troy as archer goes home wait there's one thing i wanted to say though oh, there's yeah. it's a great bit where he, he he saunters into his office because that's where they've they've got um pollock's troy they've they've brought him out of the prison and he's being held there um in a in a interrogation room um and he's just busy eating away um his, his lunch or something and his, his co-workers are saying to to um to cast her like oh we just want you to know we're really sorry about what happened to tito like his best friend basically <laughs> Yep. He's just he's just drinking his coffee and he's like, oh hey, shit happens, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love how I just I love how dismissive he is. Yep, uh, it's brilliant. Uh, so yeah, the the uh, uh, Troy uh, Archer as Troy uh, or Troy as Archer, sorry, goes home to the wife and he passes up the house. He's like, yeah, oh he my. drives right by. <laughs> He's driving through he doesn't know where he lives. Yeah, he's all, I am in hell. <laughs> he's yeah, all, he's like, I may never again. get a hard on again. <laughs> then he sees uh, the wife and he passes up his house and she, you know, he pulls back and she's on, well, it was only a matter of time until you forgot where we lived. I mean, it's such a, it's such a perfect line from uh, uh, a disgruntled wife, shall we say. And, totally. and he's like, he opens the door. You know, he's, he's got the man spread going while he's sitting in the front car. And he's like the way, you know, the one difference is he's always holding his gun, right? In a very, you know, like I'm holding my package yeah. kind of way all the time. And he's like, hey, baby. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he, you know, he kiss, you know, kisses up a little bit and she doesn't notice a thing. And he's, uh, and she's like, I got to go to work. And he's all, well, you look is, you know, I don't mind. I hate it when you go, but you look good going too, something like that. And oh, uh, it's like, I, I hate to see you go, but I love to watch you leave. Yes. And he's staring right at her ass. And uh, <laughs> then he gives him a comment. <laughs> the camera even pans in on her ass as well, yeah, like a slow motion yeah. ass shot. And uh, I mean, it's barely there that, that she's sticking bones, that one. And uh, he goes into the house and goes through the diary. <laughs> And, uh, you know, reads that they haven't uh, made love in two months. And he's like, oh, my God. And then he walks in on the daughter. <laughs> oh, dude. And he's like, oh, the plot thickens. Yeah. Uh, and- <laughs> yeah, because she's standing there in her pants. Like, <laughs> oh, sorry, her underwear for, for yeah. Americans. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> little panties. And, the, and again, the camera is like right on her ass. And uh, then he gets right up to her and is like, you know, smelling her hair. And he looks like he's about to like make out with his own daughter. But then he grabs a pack of cigarettes. Yeah. Uh, I love how he gets her name wrong as well because he called her Janie um, earlier on and he thinks that's her name. And then she's like, what the fuck do you mean by Janie? And he like looks over and there's like a pillow there with her name stitched onto it. And he's like, maybe you didn't hear me correctly. Jamie. Yeah. (laughs) It's just like. (laughs) <laughs> yeah he's able to cover him for himself pretty quickly yep and she's listening to papa's got a brand new bag and that's what he says walking out the door he's all things gonna be different around here now he likes you know smokes a cigarette inside and walks away and uh then we're back at the prison and uh yeah nick uh um oh god what am i gonna have to say now our uh archer as troy uh, sees that guard and tries to tell him that I'm, you know, I'm John Archer. I'm John Archer. And then he, you know, he just tells him to screw off because he, because he sees the brother, you know, being released. And that's when they, 
they uh he's eating a tongue sandwich and uh, the brother knows that uh art uh, troy is archer and uh they decide they're going to go straight and they're going to defuse the bomb and and that's where you find out a little bit from the motivation because the brother says well you know we lost our 10 million dollars and he's all screw our 10 million dollars i'm going to be the hero that defuses the bomb uh think about that little brother and I'm, yeah. I'm not the only you know you're not the only ones with brains in the family and then the brothers all well at least you know i'm now the only one with looks and he's all touche touche yeah <laughs> Yeah, they're having a great old time together. Just to clarify something that's going on in chat, by the way. Yes, in the in the UK, we call panties pants, whereas yeah, you Americans call pants like that's like your word for jeans or trousers or whatever. Yeah, yeah so it's confusing. I know, but yeah, yeah, and in, in that's in she's in her panties. Yeah, we yeah we don't say trousers. And what's a jumper? A jumper is like a sweater. It's a sweater. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. I don't know why we call it a jumper. You don't have to jump in it. No, but you can. I mean, it's an option. So you could. Yeah, it's, it's fine. You know, you're not banned from jumping or anything. No, you're not. Uh, so um, let me see here. We yeah. So before we get to. All right. And then they uh, they they defuse the bomb. Archer uh, at Troy as Archer goes to the L.A. Convention Center. And he gets up there and the, the guys, the, the bomb squad is like, Hey, we, you know, we can't, the, you, uh, he's all, what are you going to do? What, what should we do guys? And they said, run, uh, we can't do anything. This has got, uh, some kind of device on it that doesn't allow it to be diffused. He tells them to take off mm -hmm. and he diffuses the bomb and becomes a big American hero. And the, the it sets up just the best cheesiest line ever so we're back in the prison <laughs> i know what's coming man <laughs> yeah and uh oh god i want to get this line right too i probably could so he sees archer they just happen to be showing the news and archer uh you know is being interviewed and they're like oh, do you know who did it? he's all well i'm not at liberty to say but uh god what did he say he's, uh he, he says uh he says like if i if the guy who did it is watching i'd like to give him a message um and he just look it just whips his head around towards the camera and he's like interception now our side's got the ball sorry yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, and then, i love yeah. when he's diffusing the bomb by the way he takes the time to like remove his jacket and roll his sleeves up and he actually waits with the countdown he lets it get down to like two seconds before he disables it <laughs> yeah he does his little dance uh, yeah. Like, oh, mm -hmm. and the bomb is named Sinclair. Yes, someone in chats mentioned that, uh, and it wiggles its boobs at you when you disable it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Good little uh, That's good. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so uh, and then uh, that's when he uh, come. He, yeah, Archer goes back to the office, and everybody's applauding again. And this time, he's like loving it. He's got his sunglasses on inside, and he's like you know being showered with praise and that's when the secretary walks up and says the president's on the line and and your wife is online too well tell the president to hold and that's you know the scene you talked about where he grabs her ass yeah and, you know, i just love how he, he just paused it the camera's right on his face and he just goes like oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep and then we jump up <laughs> back home and there's a candlelight uh, like lots of candles lots of candles in the house and uh, it's date night and um he's uh He's, you know, talking about how he talked to the president and the president is basically going to write him a blank check. And, but uh, the wife was all, well, now you're going to be working again. He's all, well, you know, if I can't, if a man who works with the government can't, uh, you know, leave it behind uh, to uh, go home to his wife, then the hell with them. And he starts rubbing her feet. And they get it on. And you're just thinking about this the whole time. And uh, then we jump back to the prison. And we have a scene with uh, Nick Cage decides, uh, you know, um, he needs to get out. Mm -hmm. So he talks to Tom Jane's character. And that's where we find it. He's like, how can we get out? And he's like, you can't. How do we get these boots off? They only come off once. And that's when you're, you know, you go get uh, shock treatment, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Nick, uh, Troy as Archer or Archer as Troy. I got to get this right. Uh, decides uh, to attack a guard. He, well, he runs up to him and he goes, I'm out of cigarettes. And the guy tells him to get back in line. He's all, no, I'm really out of cigarettes. And he grabs it and starts a fight, and, uh, beats the crap out of this guard, but then gets the crap beaten out of him. And he's going to be taken straight to getting uh, the shock treatment. And this is where things get inexplicable, but brilliant. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so he's getting dragged in there, and there's a dude who's uh, Dubov, in fact, who's in the middle of being electrocuted. And I don't know how he knew that that guy was going to be in there, like the one guy in the prison that he actually needs to to be there at that moment. Uh, but he is, and he's like vomiting all over himself because he's being electrocuted, and he's like, you know, um, he's on the verge of like dying, I guess, because he's been shocked so much. Um, so they they haul him out of the chair and put um, Sean or you know Nick Cage into the chair to get his electrocution, and he's like, oh, would anyone give me a light? You know, he's still got this cigarette, yep. and so they do, you know, for for whatever reason, you know, they yep. they allow him that. Um, and just as he's getting strapped into this chair to be electrocuted, he's trying to talk to Dubov, who's lying unconscious in the corner, you know, and he's like, because the reason this guy wanted to kill him earlier, by the way, is that uh, apparently Castor Troy had a sex sandwich with his wife and his sister the same night that he was sent to prison. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So he's like, uh, I didn't touch your wife or your sister. Uh, they really love you. You're a great guy. Um, let's get out of here together. And but the guy just like comes back to life and just destroys all the guards around him. Um, and he's able to use that cigarette that he's got in his hand, like it's been lit, and he stubs it out in a guy's um, arm. You know, just as he's being strapped into the chair, so that like causes him to pull away, and it allows him to get free of his chair. Um, and so the two of them are able to break out of the room. Oh, um, and, and okay. So they get out of the room. They, they, uh, Archer as Troy puts out that cigarette on the guard. And then, um, I can't remember if it was Dubois or, or Archer as Troy takes a gurney and shoves it and takes out three guards with a gurney. And, yeah. That's Archer. Yeah. He just, he just rolls it at them. And that does, that just destroys these dudes. Dude, it takes them all out. And you know, there's, there's, you know, remember he's Archer. So he's like, try, you know, you could tell he's like trying not to kill people, but then dude, guards are just getting mowed down. <laughs> like, <laughs> absolutely mowed down. Well, Dubov is like, yeah, he's gunning them down left, right and center. And you know, Archer doesn't try and stop him. Nope. Um, and there's other points where like, there's some of them on a balcony overhead and um, he throws up a big tub of sulfuric acid at them <laughs> and shoots it in the air. So it explodes all over them. And, you know, that, that I oh. guess, is going to cause severe third-degree burns on both of these guys and probably leave them in agonizing pain for the rest of their lives. Yep. But that's, that's better than killing them. <laughs> is, is that right? One guy through the foot. Uh, but then, you know, they run into the control room, and he's all, don't kill these guys. And he lets the other two go. And then Dubov, like, turns around and kills two more guys who are coming yeah. out. Uh, I'm just like, okay, well, at least he saved those two. He was trying, at least. Um, Someone pointed out, actually, why the fuck did they even have sulfuric acid there I, in, in a cabinet? Like, what was the reason for having it in that prison? It's the same reason you have nitroglycerin in an airport hangar. It's yeah. the same reason. It's needed. It's stuff that Never goes boom, know. boom. Yes. Uh, it's Yeah, and it's just, uh, you know, mayhem and chaos now. And, uh, you know, they're shooting up all the guards and, uh, and finally in the quote unquote prison yard, it's more of a hall where they have this big screen TV that they're watching. Uh, Tom Jane, uh, you know, starts, you know, they start beating the crap out of guards and stuff. And, and, uh, Dubov eventually gets shot and he tries to save him, but he can't, uh, and he, you know, he gets shot, falls over a balcony and is hanging onto a gun, but then he eventually lets go. And while the chaos is going on, uh, uh, Tr Archer as Troy climbs up to the roof and they find out that they're on an oil rig at the prison. Yeah. Gone, can, can I just point out just before we get to this sure. point as well, like he, he gets a hold of the, the prison um, computer system. Oh, yeah. Um, and he, he obviously needs to short circuit this thing so that like the, the uh, magnetic boots don't work and the, the prisoners can run riot. And there's an <laughs> there's an option on screen for like how you want the system to be. One is like normal. One is powered down and one is called overload. And overload uh -huh. <laughs> just causes everything to explode. And it's like, why is there even an option to do that? <laughs> Uh, that's when I got my new PC. I made sure it had an overload button on it. <laughs> yeah, it's just like I pressed it by accident. This yeah. PC just melts down in front of you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's good. It's it, it it's right there in the magazine where you get um, uh, nitroglycerin and sulfuric acid. Yep, the overload button. Anyway, um, um, rest in peace, Dubov. You 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 were great. You didn't quite manage to get out, but uh, uh, 
Yeah, but you managed to save probably one of the cops who put you in. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, yeah. And Troy really did sleep with your wife and sister. He, he was yeah, there. exactly. So. What a tragic story of Dubov. <laughs> yeah. He needs his, he needs his own prequel. He does. <laughs> oh, poor guy. So yeah, the, uh, Troy, Archer is Troy's on the, on the deck of this oil rig, this inexplicable oil rig that is miles for, you can see land, but it looks like it is easily. I'll say 15 miles, 10 miles, 20 miles out it's from a, land. It's a, yeah, it's a good ways offshore. And, you know, definitely not the sort of distance that you could swim without being spotted. Put it that way. Yeah. So a helicopter comes up, starts shoot, shooting the shit out of everything. And Troy manages to evade it after a few uh, more inexplicable things explode because you want to have something that's explosive on the top of this, you know, super secret prison. That's an oil rig. And yeah, he jumps off and dude, I, I paused it on this scene and there, there might be a little CG. If there is, it was pretty good. It had to, it, they had to, because they have like a, a back scene where he's jumping off the rig. It, it looks pretty good though. Whatever they did, it looked pretty real. And then it shows. Can I fall. give you, Oh, sorry. Go. On you go. <clears throat> oh, go on. Go on. Well, I was going to give you a little factoid about the, the bit where he jumps off the oil rig and he, he, a stuntman has to jump that quite a distance to fall into the water. There's a reason that you get a shot of um, some barrels exploding next to him and setting his boots on fire and he has to take them off. It's because if you were to jump from that height with boots or shoes on, it would potentially like force them into your feet when you hit the water and, and damage them. That's why he has to be barefoot. Oh, there you go. So there you go. Knowledge, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because uh, that's a that's a fall that can kill you. Uh, uh, a, a story for another day. This is just sorry. This is me being random, but um, uh, one of the guys who uh, uh, a lot of people have jumped off the uh, Golden Gate Bridge, uh, and some have survived. And one of the survivors used to shop at my comic store. They've had uh, there's a documentary made about the guy, uh, and he told me. The story of when he hit the water and it broke a damn near uh every bone in his body and he survived uh, Damn, horrific injuries and he survived but uh he said it felt like um hitting cement it just like it it you know it was horrible so sorry but uh it made me think of that uh then we get to uh and i'll tell that in a live stream someday there's a actually a very bad documentary that was made about him they lied about it they said it was supposed to be kind of like a suicide prevention documentary but it was more of an exploitation thing about who's jumping off the golden gate bridge and stuff it was pretty bad so people were supposed to boycott the documentary i can't even remember the name of it to be honest with you um so after that they uh archer uh troy as archer goes home he's going off to work and he kind of walks by his wife and she's like what are you doing and he's like oh i'm sorry Goodbye. Good night. Goodbye, honey. Have a good day. And she's all, no, no, no. What are you doing? Are you trying to avoid, uh, you know, what's what what's about this day? And he says, yes, I'm trying to avoid it. <laughs> it's so funny watching him trying to fudge his way through all these situations, like where he clearly has no knowledge of the guy's life. And he's just trying to, like, yeah, be really vague because he doesn't know what's happening. <laughs> yep. And uh, we, then it's pretty, pretty obvious that the, it's the, the son's birthday and they have to go visit the grave. And this is where uh, you see it kind of start to get to him. Like he's really enjoying it up until this point. He's kind of loving this family life and a life he'd never had and going straight. And um, this is where things get kind of real for him. And, you know, she's crying and said, you know, he took our son and he's just kind of, you know, at first rolling his eyes, but he looks genuinely bothered and then the grave is this this little uh it's a little cherub it's a kid angel uh she puts a couple of toys on it and uh it's it's kind of you know it's kind of a sad scene there and that's when uh we find out that uh you know uh, uh, archer as troy has escaped and managed to swim 15 20 miles to shore no problem and in broad daylight i might add yes like with a helicopter chasing him yep uh, yeah, because we don't know what happened to that helicopter at all, uh, but they just, yeah, you know, the movie was, uh, we're at this point, we're about halfway through the movie. Yeah, we're about halfway through the movie. Um, Archer gets a uh, Troy 
Uh, Archer as Troy gets a car, calls his wife and says, you know, hey, the, the man you're living with is not is not Archer. You need to get out of there. And she and he's calling her at work. And uh, and uh, she says, don't ever call me again. But she's starting to think about it. Then the, the next phone call makes no sense. <laughs> he calls the office and uh, Arch, you know, Art Troy as Archer picks up. Yeah, because he's wanting to speak to Victor Lazaro, who is the head of like the, the FBI. And for some reason, it goes through to, to Sean Archer, who's actually Castor Troy. Um, I, I don't, yeah, like you say, it doesn't make any sense why it would be rooted to him when he specifically asked for someone else. But it, it's like, um, it's like Castor Troy first saw this happening and he was like, right, any calls that are for Lazaro have to go to me instead. Uh, but yeah, it's really weird. Yeah. So, and, and that yeah, it, all the police to, to his presence there now. Uh, and they knew, they, they knew he was, you know, uh, Troy as Archer knew he was going to make it. Uh, he's all show me the body, you know, because they said they told him he escaped. Uh, well, this is another weird conversation because they're like, "Oh, good, here's good, some good news for you, sir." Um, you know, Castor Troy was killed trying to escape from prison, and so he's like, "Well, uh, I want to see the body," and they're like, "Well, it hasn't been recovered yet," and he's like, "It hasn't been recovered yet. Get the LAPD on this." And then the the woman, I can't remember her name, but like the, the female agent is like, well, even if he did survive, um, he, he wouldn't be stupid enough to come to the city. And I was like, wait a minute, you just told him that the guy got killed. So is he dead or not? Like, yeah. why would you say he's dead if you don't have the body? And it's totally not confirmed that he's killed at all. Like, the only thing you really know is that he escaped from prison. Yep. And but, yeah. Wanda, I'm looking at it right now. That's Wanda, the yeah. Um, I just want to just talk about it just briefly, actually. The, yeah, the yeah. scene that you mentioned where... You know, he has to go to the grave of the boy that he killed, like unintentionally, I guess, because he didn't want to kill him. He was just oh. wanting to kill um, Sean Archer back in the day. Uh, but I think, yeah, it it, re- it adds a really interesting dimension to his character that he seems genuinely bummed out about it. You know, he seems like he's a little bit affected by it uh, and that he kind of regrets what happened. And I think that's just a nice touch to add to his character. Like, okay, he's not completely heartless about all this stuff. When he sees the consequences of his actions, he is a little bit like, oh, damn, I wish that hadn't happened. Yeah. I, I mean, like this is, um, I mean, this is Freaky Friday. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Freaky Friday. I've seen mm-hmm. both versions. And that's what it is. And, and you know, you get more empathy for each character, like you said earlier, as as things go along and, and each character kind of, you know, has a little sympathy for their life. Not much. I mean, it gets, you know, it's still an action movie, but it, it, it definitely adds to it and makes this the classic that it is. It's not, I mean, it is a brainless action film, but they do think about, you know, some stuff sometimes as far as characters are concerned, not about actual plot details. They, they blow right past a few on there, but it doesn't matter when you have such great acting skills, you know, like uh, with uh, John Travolta and Nick Cage together, uh, and it's something you don't like at the time. I, you know, I remember seeing this movie at the time and, you know, once I heard both of those names were in it, I'm like, Oh, I am there freaking opening night. I got to see this movie and loved it when I saw it. And it was everything I expect. And we were kind of spoiled back then, you know, cause I, I don't even think we have a couple of actors out there right now, like these two and, uh, and, and no desire to make a movie like this. Such, it's such a bummer. Yeah, it really is. And, uh, yeah, the, 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 are having a lot of fun while making this movie. And like I said to you earlier on, like when I was watching this, I genuinely laughed out loud multiple times while watching it because the, the, the funny scenes like with John Travolta, just being, um, being Castor Troy, it's just brilliant fun to watch. Like he is having the time of his life doing that film. He is. And, you know, they get so caught up in trying to teach us lessons these days. It's that, they, you know, and I've talked about this, especially with Star Wars, you know, it's a fun. They, they forgot what that even means in Hollywood. And that's why we went uh, to movies is to have fun, even in weird stuff like this. So, Yeah, it's like it, this is escapism at its finest, and I love it. Um, so, you know, he's. Like you say, he's uh, he's escaped from this prison now. He's trying to make contact with his wife to explain to her what's really happening. And initially, she's not interested in in hearing from him. Um, and I think this is when we also get like a great scene with um, with Castor Troy, 
when he's on the phone to his brother, like saying, like, I want you to hunt for uh, for this guy. He's going to come back to L.A. He's going to come after me. We need to find him. Uh, and, you know, eventually then I can uh, I can take him down and maybe I'll get my fucking face back. And that's when his his daughter pulls up in a car outside, like with her asshole boyfriend. And he's just on the phone, like watching as this boyfriend tries to like, a, like basically molest her. I guess he comes on a bit strong and she's not really into it. Yeah, uh, and this guy just like obviously takes it way too far and tries to force her. Um, so John, Tra- <laughs> John Travolta is like, uh, "I'll call you back. I've got some stuff to deal with." And like he just goes outside, smashes the window, pulls this guy out of the car, and beats the shit out of him. Yeah, um, and he's like, you know, say you're sorry. Like he's got pinned up against the windshield of the car, and the guy's like, "I'm so sorry. I won't do it again." Um, yeah. And then takes her inside and has a little conversation about protection. Yeah. And she's <laughs> like, what do you mean, like condoms? And he's, then he just brings out this flick knife. Uh, yep. and he's like, no, this is protection. And like next time like he, he tries something like that, just slip it into his thigh and twist it so the wound won't close up. Um, and it like gives it to her. And he's like, right, now get out of here. And then off yeah. she goes. And he just sits down in the chair like, ah, I'm the king. He's like, he's got this whole dad thing nailed in his view. <laughs> yeah, I gotta figure it out. Uh so someone Peter said actually automata is like dress up like Halloween and ghouls will try and get in your pants. Yes, yes. <laughs> that was a good line. I liked it. Um, so we got a scene before that where um Archer as Troy uh goes to Nick Cassavetti's pad, uh, who is D uh Dietrich, Dietrich's pad. Yeah, and he's that's where the the sunglasses on the inside, the techno music's playing. There's drugs freaking everywhere. Prostitutes uh, all over the place. Prostitutes. And he, you know, ends up in the house. He's like, where you been? I've been so worried about you. And he, you know, he sits him down and he brings out this box again with reverence and he opens it up and there's his two pistols and his, uh, chicle- his little pack of chicolets. And what else does he have in here? I've got, I've got it up right he's got now. Joints. He's got like pills of some kinds. Um, yeah, there is. Uh, yeah, there's about a, a ten joints, and uh, yeah, pills, the money clip, and then more blue pills. So, I pills for your pills, and um, this is where we get the just the worst cheesiest line ever. So they're talking, you know, about like I, I need to go get. Ar- I need you to take out Archer, and um, what do you want to do with him? I want to take it. We're going to do some surgery. So he does a bunch of drugs first. They they open up one of these pills and pop it into his drinks, and, and they get pretty high. Yeah, it's and like mainline and vodka and pills at the same time, man. That's good, yeah. good stuff. And especially if you're a guy who's never done this stuff before, oh, shit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, honestly, you know, yes. Yeah, when, when you got to work your way up to multiple joints, multiple pills, uh, usually to the normal human being, like one of these things does the trick. Half of them does the trick. Uh, but you build up a tolerance, of course. So after he gets like wasted, Cassavetti's character is like, what do you want to do? He's all, I want to do surgery. I want to I take his face off. And then they repeat the line like three more times. And Cassavetti's is the worst. He's standing out there and he goes, face off. Well, you know, yeah. and, and and then he's all, no more drugs for this man. <laughs> <laughs> But then you, you, yeah, you see him because he, he kind of retreats to a bedroom to try and like, you know, I guess sleep off the drugs a little bit, and he just like passes out on a bed for a while. Yep. Um, yeah, and he's like, he looks himself in the mirror, and he's like, I'm Sean Caster Archer, Sean Archer Caster, and he's like, yeah, he's tripping out a little bit. Um, but then he, he he passes out, and that's when we get to meet Sasha, who kind of wakes him up, and. The this scene segued so many times I had fucking whiplash trying to understand where her character was coming from because yeah. she's like undressing him. And you're like, what what the fuck's going on here? And like he's he's thinking the same thing. And she's like, right, you know, get these new clothes on, take this shitty stuff off, get out of here. And he's like, No, I'm not going anywhere. And then she's like, oh, what do you expect me to just jump on you, do you? And then she just, like, jumps his bones and starts kissing him. She's yep. like, is that what you expect? Like, all over him. And then he's like, no, no, that's not what I meant. Get off me. And then straight away, she's like, you need to leave. If, if the FBI find you here, they'll take my son away. I'm like, holy fuck. We've been to, like, three different places with this character in the space of, like, 30 seconds. 
<laughs> we were. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's that's kind of a thing with the drug pad like that. It does kind of work like that. So maybe John was familiar a little bit. And that's when little um, little the little boy walks in. Before that, I want to talk about real quick. I forgot. I like I went right over one of the best scenes. So as Nick Cassavetti and uh, and Troy as or Archer as Troy are talking, they they bring up, uh, you know, he's like he he talks about the, uh, you know, wanting to get Archer and getting into his house and knowing the alarm code. And it's his dead son's of the day. His it's his dead son's birthday. And the guy's like, how do you know so much? And he's like, oh, I, I sleep with his wife. And they, that's what that laughing scene. And you, I, I, I throw it into some of my videos. It's like the best, like Nick cage, he's pretending to laugh, but you know, he's like completely horrified the whole time. And it's just, it's great. It's great. How K, you know, like there is good acting in this. So he's laughing and like, and he looks like he's crying at the same time. It's so good. There's, uh, there's another scene like that in the prison where he's fighting Dubov for the first time, where he, he starts getting to the role of Caster Troy a little bit, and he starts going like, "Yeah, I'm Caster Troy," and everyone's chanting his name, and he's like, "Woo!" But like, as he does that, like he starts to kind of cry at the same time, but then he forces it away, and he starts like acting wild again and kicking the guy and beating him up and stuff. Yeah, again, like, like you say, good kind of acting from Nick Cage that he can veer from one extreme to the other so quickly yes and that's what i i love about him and, and i like um there's a re, there's a couple really bad movies he's in that i love but i love um both ghost rider movies for what they are they're terrible but i love them and uh, <laughs> great in spirits of vengeance he is because i mean nick cage has probably really done a lot of drugs i'm guessing so he knows that manic behavior that can come with it and it it's so accurately good <laughs> as far as i mean you guys think it's over i mean and it is it's crazy it's but i mean that's it's it, you know you you get like that when you get uh high and fried for way too long you've like not not enough sleep too many drugs yeah it's pretty accurate so he 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 does that stuff spot on it's method uh and uh so yeah so we we fast forward back and he's you know he's talking you know that that whole whiplash scene and that's when uh that's and then they shoot on over to the scene where the guy almost uh rapes his daughter and he gives him gives her the butterfly knife and then uh then the, the cops show up but i mean you know before that though he's seeing the kid right um and he finds out that it's actually the kid is troy's son uh and she hasn't told anybody and yeah. uh, you know he thinks he thinks of uh of mikey his kid and he does that little you know hand over his face thing and uh you know, he starts scaring the kid a little bit. You know, he starts losing it. Yeah, because he keeps calling him Michael when his name's... Yep. Um, I can't remember what his, the kid's name is. But yeah, it's obviously not Michael. And he's like, she's like, "What? why are you calling him Michael? What's going on here? And he's just holding him tighter and tighter going like, Michael, Michael! Yeah. <laughs> it's like, stop <laughs> your fucking nut job. Yep. And... <laughs> But that, they get interrupted at that point because she's like saying to him, what the hell is wrong with you? Why are you acting like this? And before he can say anything, uh, the police attack. They raid the place. Yes. And they're, they, uh, you know, our, our, Troy as Archer sends them all in. They're coming, guns a blazing. Nick's, Nick Cassavetti's character's like, I hate cups. Freaking shoots the first one who comes like repelling in. And it's just a bloodbath after that everybody freaking dies um like cops are going out left and right uh the prostitutes die one of them gets shot in the gut uh gina Kershawn's character you know grabs a gun uh they they put some uh headphones over the little kids ears so and and they're uh i forgot what the song they're playing but they're playing it's somewhere song. somewhere over the rainbow yes and it's such a cool it's a really cool juxtaposition of of themes i guess and it's it's you know it's obviously intentional and it's it's nicely played out like you're seeing this this slow motion ballet of people getting killed and stuff exploding all over the place with this like really innocent child song playing over yep. the whole thing like this lullaby um and it's very cool you know i like how they did that no nah, it was brilliant it was brilliant and then it leads up to a pretty good scene. I mean, like, listen, um, pretty much everybody dies in this one. Uh, Nick uh, Cassavetti's character gets shot in the neck. Um, Archer's isn't character. It, isn't oh. it interesting, though? He sacrifices himself to save his sister. 
because yep. uh, you know Caster Troy is about to shoot her, and he steps in front of the bullet. And isn't that a nice uh, kind of revelation about his character? That although he's like a, I guess he's a drug dealer and he's a criminal kind of kingpin, like he cares deeply about his family and he's loyal to them to the point where he'll sacrifice his life for them. You know, and yep. this this character that could just come across as a one dimensional like thug uh, is actually got these layers to him that he's willing to give up his life for someone else, and he he kind of seemed to do it willingly, like he knew that that was going to happen, he was going to get shot, um, and he, he kind of sends her on her way, trying to like cover up the fact that he's been shot, um, and it's not until she's out of the picture that he takes his hand away from his neck and blood starts pumping out, and you know. I just think that's that's a pretty cool extra dimension you get to his character. It is, and that's what makes this movie uh, a cut above when they do stuff like that. Uh, and and you know you don't see that a lot nowadays. And uh, well, it might be the lack of talent in Hollywood. Who knows? Who knows? Um, but then it, 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 chat. By the way, he also kisses his sister like she's his co. They do kind of kiss on the lips, which is a bit weird. Like, but uh, I don't know. Maybe that's what they're going, going on. But hey, you know, he cares. You know, each people care in their different ways. It's I guess. Tina Gershon, come on, man. Yeah, dude. Bound. She is. Come she on. is beautiful. Like, yeah. I'd forgotten like how attractive she was back in the day. Yeah, she's got that. Um, I mean, you know, kind of like trashy hot thing going on. That uh, yeah, like. you, you know, you, you know, girls like that, right? They're mm. not always the most beautiful, exactly, but you can just tell by looking at them. She's going to be adventurous in the bedroom. Uh -huh. She's one of them for sure. Yep, most definitely. Uh, I, I was about to say something really sexist, but uh, you know, I, well, what the hell? Uh, and now, over, man. Ten, you know, it takes like an eight up to a ten. Like when it, you know, when you see something like that, it just goes. Yeah. All right, mm -hmm, let's get down. Um, <laughs> and then uh, they this leads up to the mirror scene, which I freaking love. So there's yeah. some randomly just a bunch of mirrors, and it makes sense in this like weird drug den uh you know like upper tier <laughs> drug dealer yeah this dude basically lives in a nightclub that's that's the way the place is kitted out it looks like a nightclub it does and and one i would go to uh, and there is uh just a room full of mirrors and that's when we have uh archer and troy confront each other and they have a brief conversation uh, about like, can we just switch back? I mean, I was liking it for a little while, but you know, I think, you know, we would just be happier if we had switched back and, uh, and, and then, uh, and then, uh, Archer as Troy says, you can never give me back what you've taken from me. And he's like, okay, plan B, we'll just kill each other and yeah. then point their guns at each other and they're facing each other in the mirror. Uh, and I'm like, Sim oh, symbolically, yeah, they're fighting each other because what they see is their enemy and the reflection so on the nose but so good at the same time then this leads to randomly his i i mean i had to look back i was a little confused but um so they end up on the roof and they start fighting each other and you can tell it's the stunt man by the way like the the stunt man for john travolta is is like this kind of portly guy with uh with a wig on or something like that you can completely tell so he's chasing after uh nick cage's stunt man then Nick Cage's stuntman uh, swings, and then s the brother is there on the roof or no, something. It, no, it is Pollux who's there up on the rooftop the whole time. Yeah. So he is, he, I guess he's kind of supervising the, the uh, assault for some reason. There's no reason whatsoever for him to be there, but he is for whatever yeah. reason. And he sees... Um, you know, Sean Archer as Nicolas Cage leaving, like escaping up on the rooftop. And um, he goes after him, thinking he's going to gun him down. And, you know, Nick Cage just seems to know that he's there for some reason and he grabs a, a, a giant cable that's hanging from a crane or a gantry or something overhead and swings over to the gantry that he's on, knocks him off, and then he falls through a skylight directly onto um, Sean, or sorry, onto Castor Troy below. Yep. Like he, he lands like a few feet away from him. He grabs uh, him his legs and lifts him up and then drops him yeah. <laughs> on this, uh, down this thing. And he falls to his death right in front of uh, Archer. Troy is Archer. Yeah. So um, Troy, you know, he's, he's 
kind of crouched over his dead brother's body. He's grieving for him, you know, shocked that he's died. Um, and one of the FBI agents is there and he's like, why are you so upset? That's just Pollock's Troy. And he just, with, without missing a beat, he just turns around and shoots the guy right in the head yep. and puts him down so that he can go back to what he was doing. Um, and so what you've then got is like both men have lost someone close to them because of the other man. So what? Yeah. It's like poetry. It rhymes. It, it rhymes. And it's starting <laughs> fun for Troy. And he goes into the office the next day and there's Victor Lazaro uh, giving him some shit. Yeah. And, and uh then he uh kills him right there in the office uh because <laughs> he's got a bad ticker he sees that he has a bad ticker and uh kills him right in the office and then says uh yeah send some paramedics in uh victor lazaro's had a heart attack and I, I love when he when he's uh you know he's like oh because lazaro's giving him shit because of like the the big you know, assault on this building last night where loads of people have been killed. And he's like, look, I'm putting an end to this war on terrorism that you're trying to wage. And so he's like, oh, you know, maybe you're right. Uh, I'm going to give the taxpayers a break, but uh, I've got a confession to make and I don't think you're going to like it. And I love, he just puts his hand on the guy's shoulder and pulls him close. And then he just goes, I am Caster Troy. And just smacks him right in the chest and knocks him down and just kills him right there in front of him. Yep. It's, uh, uh, it's very cool. It was very good. And then he, you know, calmly calls the paramedics. Uh, and the next scene we have uh, Archer as Troy at the house uh, with the wife, and he's trying to convince her that he is that he is Archer, and she's freaking out. So he just says, uh, "You got to listen to me. Uh, we have a different blood type. My blood type is type O negative. His is AB. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to find out for sure, that's the way to do it." And he just bails. Uh, and, you know, they have a, they, you know, they also have a little conversation. And, you know, he's, you know, he's explaining like, hey, the last night I was here, uh, we had an argument in this room. I slept in Mikey's bed. So that's something like only he would know. Right. Uh, so she has to be, it's, you know, it, she doesn't just figure it out right away, but it, she's at least suspicious. Yeah, I think the 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 way they go about this is kind of plausible. Like she's already got doubts about the guy because he's been acting so strangely. Um, Nick Cage comes in, he gives this information that only only her husband could really know because no one else was privy to that. Um, and then the blood type thing, so it makes her suspicious enough to follow up on it. In which case, she does manage to take a sample of his blood while he's sleeping and um, tests it. And yep, sure enough, like it, it comes up A B type blood type ab which is not his blood type and so she knows then that uh, something is up and he's he's fortunately in the hospital in the room with her without her wow. knowing but yeah i don't know how you managed that but well done well done exactly and you know and she's still not like a hundred percent convinced she's like i don't trust anybody right now he's all you got to trust me and she's like, i don't trust anybody and that's you know good um and that's when uh, that's when Archer uh, shows up later to work, and he's like, oh, "What are you doing?" You know, and she's like, "I'm just working stuff." And uh, he walks away, and he goes, "Oh man, uh, act you know, acting strange, lies. This is turning into a real marriage." Yeah, it's like lies, distrust, mixed messages. <laughs> this is turning into a real marriage. <laughs> Uh, Someone, yeah, someone's given us the exact quote here on on uh, on Super Chat Automata: lies, distrust, mixed messages. <laughs> beautiful. Yeah, okay. um, I love how he's just got his henchman with him at that point as well. Like he's kind of dropping all pretenses of being Sean Archer, right? You know, he's yeah, he's just got his guys with him. Yeah, because you can just like deputize FBI agents and secret. Uh, co uh, secret op agents whenever you want and have your state's witness, you know, on, on raids and stuff. It happens all the time. By the way, did you notice that uh, the, the guy, the, the white guy who uh, of his two henchmen, um, he's got like long hair. He was in season three of Westworld. He's got like, he's an older man now. And he's like uh, one of the guys early on who gets killed and replaced with a, you know, a, a robot. Um, and he becomes like one of Dolores's helpers throughout the rest of the show. But he is a Scottish actor. Yes. And he, you might notice that he's got some very visible scars along his, uh, along his jawline. And that's where he got glassed outside a pub in Glasgow, apparently. 
and that's why he's that's why he's got them. Yeah, Tommy Flanagan mm. sounds like the kind of guy who would get glass outside of a pub. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've all yeah. been there. It makes him look hard, you know. So yeah, that's right. He was in Westworld, but uh, yeah, he's much younger in this, obviously. Yeah, and he was he's been in a bunch of stuff, bunch of stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, good character actor. And this all leads us to our climactic scene, which is just bonkers, man. Oh, shit gets <laughs> real at this point. Yeah, so um, with with Lazaro dead, you know, Castor Troy as Sean Archer is going to become the next boss of the FBI. Um, and he's going to be basically untouchable by that point. But the only time he's going to be vulnerable is at the funeral. And so that's where... Um, that's where Sean decides he's going to spring his trap and try and take him down. Um, and that's where all of these different um, characters kind of coalesce in this big showdown. At, uh, what got, what, it's got to be the coolest fucking church I have ever seen. Like, it's yeah. right on the beachfront. It's got beautiful views. The sun's just setting. There's palm trees everywhere. It's like, man, if I, ha- if I was to be laid to rest, that's where I would want it to be done. Yes, I was like, I want a funeral like this. I want doves and seagulls and a gunfight at the end. Yeah, <laughs> you should come to a funeral in Scotland, man. They're fucking wild. Oh, you might not get a gunfight, but you'll definitely get some more fatalities. Oh, right on. <laughs> that's that's what I want. I want company. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah. So it's it's yeah. There's doves. It's really Catholic. They are man. They're laying it on. They've got the. Uh, the Latin going and uh, the, like John Wu and his religious iconography. Like he loves that shit. Like the chanting and the, yeah, like you say that the, the Catholic ceremony, the crucifix, the doves is all there. Yep. Slow-mo. So yeah, Nick, uh, Nick cage, uh, you know, uh, Archer as Troy walks up slowly and he, um, uh, I'm not Catholic, sorry. So he, he, when he walks into the church, he blows out the candle thing, and he, you know, says a little prayer, pulls out his the picture of his son, and then hands it to an acolyte or whatever they're called. Sorry, and uh, he passes it to uh, Troy as Archer, and he says, "Somebody wanted me to give this to you," and it's a picture of uh, of Michael, and Archer's, you know, just does his, uh, you know, brilliant. John Travolta overacting like, geez, you know, and then he crushes the picture. Yeah, uh, like bearing his teeth and shit while he's doing it. It's like, fuck, he's coming for me today. This yep. is where we're going to do it. And then we got an uh, everybody, you know, they take the casket out and it's empty. And there's uh, there's uh, Ar- Ar- Archer as Troy is just sitting in the standing in the church and he's looking at uh, the crucifix and says a little prayer. You know, it's real lucky that Castor Troy didn't just gun him down while his back was turned and he was at the altar. You know, it's lucky he he took the time to approach him and they can have a conversation, you know. A little monologuing, you know. Yeah, Mm -hmm. John John Travolta comes in with his, like, um, Dominus Cabis, the rest of the sorrow. Like, (laughs) oh, isn't this all very religious? Uh, (laughs) He even does, like, the crucifix pose. He does. And, uh, you know, <laughs> former Catholic uh, John Travolta, now Scientologist, of course. And then this leads to um, in the Catholic Church at the end of the American action film, uh, we have a Mexican standoff. So um, we have the henchmen come in. G- Gina Kershaw, uh, uh, Nick Cage sent Gina Kershaw off with, and, sh- and he said, uh, you know, I promise Archer's off your back from here on out. And she's all, thank you. But then she comes back, which, which, yeah, which I like though. Um, it yeah. again, it shows like he he recognizes that you know they're for all um, Castor Troy's faults, like there are good people around him, and you know she's been perhaps unfairly caught up in all of this, and you know, obviously from his point of view, if if everything worked out great and he was able to be restored as um, Sean Archer, he wouldn't pursue her anymore. He wouldn't want to you know hassle her. He would rather that she just go off and live peacefully with her son. So I think that's a, a good scene between them. Yep. Uh, which, and, and that, and that forgiveness, you know, draws her back and um, we get uh, the henchmen have uh, Archer's wife and they are there. And then, you know, uh, they're also sending for his daughter 
Uh, yeah, it, this was weird because one of the guys brings her there in a car and then presumably just left her and then went into the church by himself because he shows up for that Mexican standoff, yeah. but she's not with him. Yeah. So I don't know what he said to her. It was like, you know, oh, I brought you here to this funeral. It's real important. You just wait here. <laughs> I'm going yep. off to do some stuff. In the meantime, everybody's outside, I guess, where they're burying the body. And they're in this empty church. And we have, uh, you know, the henchmen and the wife. And then another henchman comes in. Gina Gershon's got her gun to uh, Archer as, or Troy as Archer. And everybody's got their guns on each other. And she even just, throws Nick Cage an extra gun, so he's got two guns to to point at the two henchmen. Yep. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of people with guns all pointed at each other, and and that's when you get this amazing line from uh, from Caster Troy, where he's like, "Wee, what a predicament!" Yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, then Gina Gershon kind of uh, she sees, you know, they're all looking at each other. There's tight shots on the eyes, and then somebody's, you know, I don't, quick. yeah, I. I, did I miss something with this, right? Maybe you maybe you understand the meaning of this, but like she looks at each of them and certain ones, like Nick Cage and I guess Joan Allen, everyone else is looking at each other, but the two of them glance down. They glance down at like they're looking at the floor or something. Yeah, and it's cool. almost like the way they, they both turn their eyes downwards like clues her in that they are together or that they're good guys or something like i don't quite understand what was meant to be happening yeah. in that scene so troy as archer says i'm caster troy and uh gina Gershon just i says i'm tired and then i think we might have some proof that uh women are a hive mind they both looked at each other and looked down and maybe that's where they communicated where that that's where it <laughs> <laughs> like oh really we, we like always it. knew it like they they all just are psychically linked to each other yeah, you know <laughs> gotcha yeah. uh, and uh she gina gershon like jumps on uh the, the wife and pulls her down and everybody starts shooting and archer as troy has luckily two guns and he takes out two henchmen you know just with crossing his arms and yeah there's there's, there's just guns going off everywhere there's no fucking clue what's happening but it seems like both of the henchmen get taken out in this this shootout and it ends up with uh, Gina Gershon on top of Nick Cage um just nicely positioned and she's like oh I'll look after my, our boy cuz yep. I got killed and then she just fucking dies <laughs> she got shot yeah. i guess I can know. I mean, it was just very peaceful. She's like, "Don't let him turn out like us." And thanks, he's gonna die. Now. I love. He, he's so like. Uh, he's so kind of. You know, I've got no time for this because he sort of just goes, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like whatever." Uh, yep. I got bigger things to deal with right now. And could you just die, please? Okay, I'm sorry about this. It's a bad time, but yeah. And uh, sh they show a little blood come out, and that's it for her. Yeah. And that's where uh, it, the daughter, you know, comes rumbling in and um, she ends up with a gun at some point. Uh, oh, Christ. The, like there's because the, you know, Caster Troy as Sean Archer makes a run for it. Like and, and um, Sean starts shooting at him and there's a bunch of shooting going on. He gets his hands on an Uzi. Um, Janie shows up or sorry, Jamie. Um, the daughter shows up and she's like, Dad, what's going on? And he's just like, John Travolta just starts wailing on her with this um, Uzi. And so Nick Cage has got to try and protect her. She falls down a fucking flight of stairs. And it's <laughs> it's so funny because she properly falls all the way down to the bottom. Like this thing goes around like two turns and yes. he's just running down behind her like as she tumbles down. And still John Travolta is firing at her somehow. Yep. And um, that's when he was a hell of a shot earlier and yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. And she's fine by the way, after falling down all these stairs. Yeah. They, these guys can blast at each other with, with submachine guns from like 15 feet away and not hit anything. It's it just as the plot requires. It is great. Um, but she does um, end up at one point, like the two of them are fighting each other. The, the two guys, they're wrestling. Um, Nick Cage manages to get him pinned against the wall with like a machine gun up against his throat, like he's choking him with it, and he's like, "Die, please, God, die!" And of course, she she grabs a gun from the ground, not understanding the situation at all. Um, and this, of course, the two of them are are trying to convince her that they're her dad, and the other one is the one that she should shoot. 
Um, and she ends up shooting Nick Cage in the arm because she, she can't aim properly. And uh, that's when John Travolta is just like a oh, fucking useless. And it's like, no daughter of mine would shoot so wide. And that's when he takes her hostage. But that's when a, a nice little uh, throwback to earlier in the movie comes back to haunt him. She yep. brings out the, uh, the, the, the butterfly knife and plunges it right into his leg and like stabs him. Um, and that's enough to like disrupt him so that he, he runs off. Um, yes. And, that, and, and Eve is calling Wanda in the, during all the chaos, she's calling Wanda who is Margaret Cho. So yep. the police are being called in and they arrive amazingly fast. Um, and I love the, as well when it, when she, when she finds her daughter again and her daughter's like traumatized, but what by all this nonsense that's just happened to her. And she's like, well, someone please tell me what planet I'm on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's so good. And uh, this uh, leads us to the boat chase. Uh, oh, which, yeah. Yes. Which is long and good. It's brilliant. Uh, it's like the, it's like the fire truck chase from Con Air. It's yeah. like we've we've still got like another ten million dollars in the budget. What the fuck can we blow it on? Ah, let's get some speedboats in there. Yep. Oh, dude, Con Air. Maybe that's what we should do next because that I love that movie. Quite possibly, yeah, yeah. Oh. Another Nick Cage classic. Yes. Uh. So yeah, they are. Um. They get on the. Uh, there's okay for one before they get on the boat. Uh. The, the I guess the at the dock the little office blows up because <laughs> it was there, next to another boat there's always, yeah. Yeah, there's always cans of propane just lying about like yes. when someone fires a stray round they just explode yep and uh we've got um two guys riding around on boats with hair plugs that don't fall out so that's pretty good and yeah they're just dodging boats and then one of them ends up outside of the boat and water skiing without skis on the side with his suit on. And that, yeah, that must have, that was a hell of a stunt. Yes. It's it not was. something you really appreciate until you realize how much strain must have been on this guy to like maneuver himself into that kind of position. Cause he's getting dragged along by it just by the arm. And he manages to turn himself around so that he's, he's got his feet planted in the water. Um, and yeah, it's very obviously a stunt double, but, yeah, what what a stunt it for what it is. Impressive as hell. Uh, they got the Los Angeles police boat after them, and this thing goes on. And wait, there's another big explosion right there. Yeah, because they, yeah. The, <laughs> the police boat just sees these two speedboats firing at each other, like cruising along at like 50 miles an hour, and they're like, uh, "Oh shit, you have to stop, stop!" And um, you know, Castor Troy just starts blasting away at them with a with an Uzi. Um, and they're like, oh, open fire. And he just manages to take out the entire bridge crew of this this um, police <laughs> boat, which then spins around in a circle. And um, Nick Cage's boat goes right through it. It, it drives up it like it's a, it's a ski ramp. And it's just everything explodes. Guys go flying everywhere. Everything's on fire. It's just brilliant. <laughs> yep. Uh, and then everything uh, explodes in this movie. <laughs> everything explodes. And then he gets. Uh, uh, Troy is Archer attacks Archer as Troy with an anchor and uh, God, uh, you can totally tell these are the freaking uh, stunt. This st <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's it's when they get launched through the air, isn't it? That's like, yeah. yep, that is clearly two stunt doubles right there. <laughs> yep, it, this is like '60s TV. This is like uh, you know Star Trek uh, season uh, one and two when you. That's <laughs> so great. And here's they they do the water skiing and then they end up you know the boat crashes on a beach. And the they, boat crashes into some kind of uh, oh, yeah. like cradle for another boat or whatever, and it just it stops midair. Yep. The two guys on board just get launched through the air like fucking cannonballs, um, along with the harpoon gun that Nick Cage was trying to reach, um, which lands conveniently close by. And so they're they're both like deposited on this beach where they can they can fight each other again because they haven't done enough fighting in this movie already. Yep. And, uh, oh yeah, it's, it's, uh, the boat was on the anchor. That's right. The boat was on the anchor and it just stopped <laughs> and they go flying. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> great. Uh, and yeah, I'm just pausing on the shot right now. And it was like, yeah, that, that guy's like a, it's like a 30 year old guy who's playing uh John Travolta. He wasn't 30 at this time, by the way. Oh, he must've been mid forties easily. Yep. 
and they fight some more and then they finally he finally just gets harpooned oh well, uh, yeah because he, he he shoves the harpoon gun into his leg so both legs are fucked at this point and he's pinned up against the wall and you know he's like oh you know you're right shawnee i've been a bad boy i need to be punished and just as he fires the harpoon gun fucking john travolta grabs the 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 gun and just you know, clamps his hand out on it so the harpoon can't launch at him. Um, and that's when he's when he uh, he says to him, like, you know, but remember, every time you look in the mirror, you're gonna see my face. And he starts like cutting his own face off. Yep. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. And so Nick Cage is like, oh fuck, I want this. I need to stop him because he's fucking up my face. I need to get it back. <laughs> and, yeah. he's, and his solution is to just kick him right in the balls. Yeah. And it's enough to make him let go of the harpoon gun so that he can fire it. And it's just brilliant. Yep. <laughs> He's just sitting there twitching, right? Uh, and so, he even screams at him like, die! Yep. And, and he starts singing again, uh, you know, uh, at, at, towards the end as he's dying, as he's twitching on the harpoon. Ready for the big ride, baby. <laughs> yep. And uh, then all the cops show up. And uh, so, so, um, and uh, uh, Wanda, I think, yeah, as Wanda shows up, Margaret Cho's character, and she uh, walks up to uh, Nick Cage and goes, are you okay, Archer? And he's like, what'd you call me? Archer. <laughs> Archer. And he's like, oh, my God. And, um, <laughs> and yeah, so uh, it shows them going away in the ambulance, and then they, they get the surgery, and uh, then we get the slow-mo see- scene of um, – you know, Archer's back and he walks in and it, it, there's like this blinding angelic light in the background as he slowly walks, you know, the wife Eve sees him in the window, but then she opens the door and he's not there, but then he turns the corner and uh, yes, the, the light behind him slowly. Yeah, his face restored. Yep. Perfectly. I, 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 I honestly thought it'd be funny as fuck. If like, you, you know how like she sees him coming up to the door, like in silhouette, because like the sun's behind him and then she like you say she runs up to the door and opens it and she's waiting for him to appear i always thought it'd be funny as fuck if he came around the corner and his face was all messed up like yeah. <laughs> totally like shaking and stuff it's like oh shit the surgery didn't go too well oh fuck no <laughs> oh and um and just because it wasn't laid on thick enough he's all i've got somebody you should meet and he brings in you know caster <laughs> kid and uh yeah he needs a place to live so they got a replacement kid what a happy ending and uh oh by the way he doesn't need a scar anymore at first he insisted on keeping a scar when he turned back you know the bullet scar from when um, Mikey died and uh, before he went into surgery, he's like, I don't need that scar anymore. I'm good. Uh, because I gotta you replace know, it. Well, you know, what I'd probably also say to the surgery team is like, yeah, do you want to just like leave me with the body of Castor Troy? Because like, you know, he's in better shape than I am. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Can we just like, I, I don't need that extra weight back right now. <laughs> yep. But they, they, they somehow managed to give him his weight back and that's where the movie ended. And I freaking loved it. I yeah, love like you, like you say. I just love how it's like an, a replacement son, bro. Yep. <laughs> it's like this kid's gonna live with us now. Yeah. And she's like, oh, okay. It's like I don't know anything about him. I, like this kid could be from anywhere. Is he dangerous? I don't know. Well, like, he's, I mean, just, like, he's our son now. He's the son of a of a hardened drug terrorist, and uh, you know uh, who oh. who has witnessed like basically the battle of stalingrad playing out in his fucking like you know nightclub apartment yeah um, right in front of him while over the rainbow was playing like i'm sure that won't have long-term psychological repercussions for him at all nope yeah that's not gonna require years of therapy um (laughs) now apparently and we talked about this there was supposed to be a different ending for this they were going to leave it ambiguous uh and in some way were um something i think what they said at the end was i don't know if they uh here let me get to that real quick it, but it's okay so um 
So they, yeah, the special edition DVD contains several deleted scenes, uh, most notably an alternate ending in which Sean Archer looks into a mirror and Eve gasps as she sees and the audience sees Caster Troy's face as Archer's reflection. The studio nixed this ambiguous ending in favor of a happy conclusion in which Archer, Archer is definitively completely himself again and Caster is dead with no chance of returning. So what was the implication of that that deleted scene? Was it like the the some portion of his psyche re remained, or like literally Caster Troy was still wearing his face and he'd come back and he was just still in pace impersonating Sean Archer? I guess it was supposed to keep it open like that. Where uh, I would think it would be more that he got some of Troy's personality traits or something through DNA or whatever, because they just replaced faces. It's not like they replaced personalities, um, mm. but, uh, or that they, something happened at the hospital and somehow, you know, uh, Troy survived again. Uh, I don't know, but I think honestly, I would have been, okay, I'd have been okay with this ending, but I love the happy ending. It's fine. It's, it's very, it's very of the time. And, it makes this a singular film that will never have a sequel. And that's what's great about it. It just, yeah, I, I, I would never want a sequel to this. Like this is, this is one and done and it's perfect. And yeah, I am happy with it. Um, genuinely, like I was saying to you earlier, um, I watched this like this afternoon here just so I could get refreshed with it. And I had the time of my life. I laughed so much <laughs> at it. Yeah. Like, it's nice to see something this fun again. So yeah, I was laughing my ass off too. Yeah, uh, I just I never laugh at action movies now. I never have fun with them as much as I used to. You know, these these ones are just a different era. You know, and you know, I I there's still a part of me that's like, oh, the late nineties. It's not that long ago, but now it really is, and it really feels like it. And yeah, that's that's wow. kind of a sad thing. It really is. It was tw oh, man. This movie's. 23 years old so, oh wow yeah makes you feel old makes me feel old anyway there's okay. there's one bit in it that that uh made it feel somewhat contemporary where uh jamie is like talking on the phone to her boyfriend and she's like oh i got your email carl uh those photos you sent were pretty cool or, or pretty kinky or something like that yeah. and i was like ah email that was a thing in in 97 <laughs> it, was it was available then Oh, the, the early internet was so fun. Oh, it was such an innocent time, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. Like, this thing is great. What I it, This is going to change the world. Things are going to be so much better now. Yeah. Mm, boy. So yeah, good. that worked out well, didn't it? It really uh, did. If there's, something, if there's one like thing I could remove from human development, it would be social media. Probably. I think all of us would be infinitely happier without it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we'd have to sacrifice our YouTube channels, but um, for the betterment of the world, I'd be okay with that. I really would. Um, yeah. I managed to have a really good time without it. Uh, I, you know, God, and now there's, you know, this, you know, we're going to sound old. Get off my lawn. But, um, you know, this this whole couple generations now who have no idea what it's like without it and couldn't imagine life without it. And I don't know how I managed, but I did. Uh, we did. We got around. We had fun. The phone worked, you know. Uh, but you know, you were talking about fun, like how this movie was fun and, and I don't want to get on this big thing about the boys. We can talk about that the other day, uh, another day, but that's what, um, the, even the series, the first series I liked, right. Uh, but this is kind of what the comic is in tone. It's like, it, you know, it's grosser, it's much grosser and it's still got a lot of the dark stuff that the, the show does get right in some aspects, but it's missing just the nod and the wink and the tongue in the cheek that the comic had. And I think it would be better for it. And I think that's what a lot of things are missing right now uh, because the, you know, everything has to be so serious all the time. And uh, that's what I really loved about this movie. So, yeah, the, there was no attempt to put forth a social message or anything like that. This is just purely a fun action movie with, with a little bit of like kind of character intrigue, added in to, to put an interesting slant on it. And I think that that's all you need. Like, particularly in the realm of action films, I do not need social commentary in my action movies. I just want to see stuff explode. And 
you know, like I said to you earlier, like what's infinitely more satisfying about this movie is there, there's no or very little CGI in it. So when you see things explode, it's all pyrotechnics, it's all practical effects, and it's just great fun to watch. It, it really is. And imagine the possibilities of social commentary you could get out of a movie where you replace faces with people. It oh. would uh, be cringe as hell. They would... Oh. Yeah. But yeah, this was a time when you could just, rather than try to put forward a message about how certain demographics have it so much harder, or, you know, this person or that person is, is disadvantaged or whatever, it's like, we don't care about that. We're just going to look at two people, one's on the, the side of the law, one's the, the other side, but they start to get tied together a little bit by this thing. They start to understand each other's lives a little bit. And it's about the characters. It's about the personalities. It's about the, the people, the humans, not the social ideas. Right. You know, remember, remember when we could do that with films? That was nice. I like that. And and that's why you know you were noticing that this just seemed like we we're following like six or seven people through, throughout this film, right? And we, do, we don't really go outside of that much. Uh, we'll see a news thing here that and it just stays focused on their story. Nothing gets caught up and it's simplified and that's what makes it work. Uh, and it doesn't make you think about anything broader than, Oh, that exploded. That was fun. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and just, and how much you laughed, uh, how funny this movie was. And that's, that's what makes it work. Cause, uh, it, it's, it's hilarious. This is, uh, I mean, damn near a comedy <laughs> at, at times. So, uh, that's what I, yeah, that's, that's what makes it a little special. Um, plus being like the most ridiculous concept, you know, even back then we're like, what, <laughs> you know, uh, but still, uh, it was just because Travolta and cage were in it. That was the only reason I watched this movie. I think, you know, um, I would, you know, back when I was younger, I was aware of John Woo was really hot in the late nineties, like everybody, you know, where, uh, they were talking about, you know, all his older films and he came over here and did a few, uh, I don't even know what he's doing anymore nowadays. You know, um, he, he did like, in terms like once he moved to Hollywood, he did, um, his first movie was like hard target in Hollywood, I think with like Van Damme. And that was actually quite cool. And it had all his hallmarks. It had the slow-mo, it had the doves, all that sort of thing. He did broken arrow with John Travolta. That was pretty good. Uh, were pretty successful. Then he did Face Off. Then he did one of the Mission Impossible movies. And then he did like Wind Talkers, like a World War II movie. And then it kind of just disappeared after that. It was weird. Yeah. Uh, he's still like directing. I'm looking at his <clears throat> IMDb now. And I'm, uh, uh, he did Mission Impossible 2, right? Uh, which cost Doug Ray Scott the Wolverine gig. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, I, I was okay with uh, Mission Impossible 2, actually. I quite enjoyed it. Yeah, for what it was. Once I got past one, uh, I you know make, making Mister Phelps the bad guy just infuriated me. I was just pissed because um, I watched that show. I watched the show as a kid. I loved it. Uh, so it, it it's it's you know if you didn't watch the show, it's like making Kirk the bad guy in a remake. You know, uh, mm. you know of Star Trek. Uh, but he did The Crossing in 2014, uh, and yeah. Oh, I wonder if he went. Yeah, I wonder if he was just he went back to uh, making movies uh, um, back east. Uh, yeah, but uh, he, oh god, he's done a lot of movies. Holy shit! Since sixty, he co-directed his first movie in nineteen sixty-eight. Yeah, he's like in his seventies now, so he's he's getting on a bit. Maybe he's kind of done with movie making. Might be. You know, yeah, he but was he, I, I, I do like his visual style. Um, I, I think, um, you know, it's nice to have some iconic trademarks, and like obviously with him, it's the slow mo, it's the doves, it's the 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 sort of religious iconography. You know, all of those things are hallmarks of John Woo movies, and it's it's good. Um, I really enjoyed Broken Arrow. Actually, <laughs> it's another movie I I would like to talk yeah. about at some point. Oh uh, God, yes, that. Uh... Do not fire at the nuclear weapons. Um, yeah, I, I fucking love Travolta in that. Um, yeah. Because like the, the scene where he, he kind of um, comes in um, and it's like slow motion in the desert and he's got his sunglasses on and his, his pilot's uniform and stuff. He's just like, this guy is like the coolest son of a bitch on the planet. And it's like, how did he go from that to being like everyone's creepy uncle? You know, when you see the pictures of him like trying to kiss Scarlett Johansson really awkwardly and she's like, absolutely not into it at all yep 
uh wow yeah. yeah i don't know uh lots of stuff we don't know about him that's that's for sure uh, yeah broken arrow once a thief face off blackjack mission impossible 2 would hard boiled i saw hard boiled fucking awesome man that's a good movie uh the and, killer as well yep yep i remember you know watching all these in the in the video store i worked at where we uh you know when we closed up we could pop on more violent movies uh yeah it, but it, this is uh part of an era that is that is long gone uh, for the time being, whether it swings back around and, you know, we loosen up as a, as a people, <laughs> you know, and sometime soon and remove the stick from our collective asses, uh, then uh, maybe we'll get something like this again or, uh, or maybe some independent, you know, that's probably what will happen is there'll be some independent movement and, you know, you'll probably have to see it as, as a, either a web series or a web movie. Uh, considering what's going on with the theaters right now, yeah, it's 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 kind of crazy what's going on. Um, we do have uh, we do have some super chats here. Um, sure. Would you be would you be up for going through some of them? Absolutely. Um, I know you're you're on a little bit of a time limit, but we can try and get through as many as possible, I guess, because I think some of them are specifically for you. So I'll try and go through as as we go. Um, let's see. Our, Charles Caballero says, who here is extra creeped out after learning that John Travolta's daughter in the film, Dominique Swain, was a minor while filming took place? Think of when John sniffed her hair, F Hollywood. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how old she was in it. Um, if you're saying she's a minor, I, I guess I'd have to believe you. I don't have time to look her up. Um, but yeah, she did look very young in the film. Like she was definitely a teenager of some sort. Um, I, I guess that's what they were going for in that scene where he's like, you know, He's posing as her dad, but he's clearly not, and he's like attracted to her in that way, and he's it's quite um, openly flirtatious. Yeah, it's uh, um, people, people are saying she was sixteen. Apparently, fuck sixteen. Damn. Yeah. Okay, I take back what I said about her being good looking. <laughs> Don't yeah. sue me. I didn't know. Yeah. Uh, what she's in a bunch of stuff now. Don't I've never me. seen her in anything else apart from this movie. I have no idea what she's done af like after Face Off. It has been a bunch of she. She was, uh, yeah. I don't think I've heard of anything she was in. I'm kind of looking over her IMDb right now. Is it just like I, indie stuff? It is all like TV movies. Uh, she was in a Nazi Overlord, uh, Blood. Uh, Crap. Uh, 2177, the San Francisco love hacker crimes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. I'd never heard any of this stuff. It didn't go into great things then or after face off. Now she, there's a bunch of movies that she's in. That's, <laughs> I wonder if IMDb is going to look like this now. She's got like nine movies that are in, uh, post-production completed, completed, but they're not out yet. I think that's what a lot of IMDb's are going to look like for a long time. But yeah, nothing I've ever heard of. So that, that's that's pretty much what Nick Cage's IMDb looks like nowadays. Where he's like he's in about five or six movies per year, like all of them, like you've never heard of, and they're pretty much straight to DVD. Yep. Oh. The guy's got guy's got legal bills to pay. <laughs> you know? he does. He's done some insane stuff. I remember. Uh, uh, Old his comic collection, which killed me to hear that. Uh, yeah, did he not have an, an original Superman comic? He did. God damn, man, that's the at, sort of thing you don't let go lightly. No, at the time, and this was years ago, there was only ninety nine left on the planet um, that were not restored, that were genuine. Uh, there's probably less than that uh, that we know of. But yeah, oh my god. He was the voice of Superman in the Teen Titans Go movie. Yeah. So he was also the voice of Spider Man Noir in uh, Into the Spider Verse. He was, and he nailed that. God damn, that was <laughs> that was brilliant. Uh, yeah, he's got an untitled Nicolas Cage Amazon Studios project, uh, Jiu Jitsu, The Crudes, A New Age, Prisoners of the Ghostland, Pig. Wally's Wonderworld 10 double zero and the unbearable weight of massive talent. <laughs> is he not also going to be playing Joe Exotic yes, in the biopic of him? God, that's going to be incredible. 
God. I can't wait. Yeah. Um, there's another one from Charles Caballero here saying, when you guys plus Az and Doomcock make a live cast for Rocky, will you all sing the rendition of Take You Back, the first song sang by the Dumpster Fire? Oh, yeah, I remember that. Take you back. Do, 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 do. Take you back. Um, yeah, we, we will see on that one. Um, I'm trying to get something sorted with Az and Doomcock at the moment. Um, Az has destroyed his vocal cords recently, yes. so he is really struggling with doing live streams. Um, Doomcock has seen the first four Rocky movies, but shockingly, he's not seen five and six, which uh, I told him to get sorted. So we'll see what we can do there. Yeah, uh, Rocky Five. I saw it in the theaters. Damn, yeah. that was that was a little bit before my time. I yeah. never got a chance. I, I would be pretty sad if that was my Rocky theater experience. Um, but I did see Rocky Six in the theaters and absolutely loved it. Um, I genuinely want to do a review of that movie because I think it. If you're going to redeem a franchise, that's how you do it. Uh, yeah, God, that was in uh, 2006, right? Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It, um, yeah, it, it seemed like such a ludicrous idea at the time, but when you actually see it played out on the screen, I genuinely hold it up as a really great movie um, and one that really redeems like at the, the franchise after five. So it was nice yeah. that he got the, the send-off he deserved. Yeah, because five ends with a street fight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just it's a real downer of a film. Like yeah. it's it that you could have fixed five genuinely if instead of having a street fight, Rocky just accepts his challenge to to have a proper boxing match, and he has to train again, and he has to get ready for it, and then they have a fight, a proper fight. Um, I think that would have redeemed the film because I totally get what Stallone was going for with five, you know, to take Rocky back to his roots and everything, but. Uh, yeah, it was just too depressing. It was too down for me. Yep. Uh, another one here. Cobra Kai is officially premiering on January the 8th, 2021. Are you still nervous about the show going woke and further taking Hawk's legendary status away? I am. I'm worried about the show going woke for sure because every show that gets moderately popular seems to go woke these days. Um, and the, the, the thing that made the first season so awesome was that it wasn't woke. So. Who knows? I think the chances are better than not, folks. I, I hate to sound so black pill about entertainment right now, but after uh, the seventh episode of The Boys and uh, season two of Umbrella Academy and you know what we saw with Westworld and I saw Mr. Robot go downhill and uh, you know a lot of shows that I like, Legion, went downhill all because uh, they – decided to just inject it with a bunch of really ham-fisted social commentary that took away from uh, what came before. And it just made characters not act like they were before. And all of these shows, all these characters just start, started acting differently. And they became the, different. You know, it, it yeah. Uh, yeah. Umbrella Academy was really heavy-handed with all the, the racial politics of the 1960s. Like that was what was the I, I can't remember the character's name, but it was like the she's like an an Indian actress that was in season two of Umbrella Academy. She was like Diego's girlfriend. Yep. Uh she it was legit one of the worst actors I think I've ever seen in any TV show ever. I don't know where they dug this fucking idiot up from, but she was like the worst thing to happen to that show ever. Yeah. I don't it, no idea why they cast her. It it took away from uh diego had a bit of a journey and then the t yeah the, the thing with the umbrella academy is it, why you shouldn't fill a show like that fill with social commentary because it was a whimsical fun show i think uh i think it was doomcock who kind of compared it to willy wonka in far as tone like it's mm -hmm. just takes place in a different world in a different uh, so when you put that real world stuff into something that was more fanciful it just rips you right out of the story and there's parts of season two that are great that are absolutely great and then it just gets bogged down with uh and, and scenes that like shouldn't even be there like half the half of it you could have cut out and you didn't need um uh yeah it was a bummer because i loved season one thought season one was great yeah uh, i enjoyed it 
Um, but yeah, the, the I, I I couldn't be bothered with the focus on the JFK assassination, all the that that kind of nineteen sixties setting. You know, I was just like, this sort of thing has been done a million times before. Why are we revisiting this sort of tired old trope of like, oh, could we prevent the JFK assassination? Do we have the right to do that? Fuck. Oh. You know, is this the most inventive thing you could come up with out of all the the possibilities? You know, yeah. the, the the best thing that came out of that season was five. You know, he's still an awesome character. I really like him. But like everyone else just got dumbed down to the extreme. And it was just such a disappointing thing to see. It really was. The kid who plays him is a genius. Uh, yeah. He's so good at it. But you're right. It gets bogged down by tropes that we are tired of, especially like, you know, if you're within our generation of the one before, you know, we have just been hammered with hippies and freaking the JFK assassinate, like over and over again. It's like, okay, it's done. Can we move on to something else, please? Yeah. Um, Vigilante Williamson here says, this is legitimately one, <laughs> sorry, legitimately one of my favorite movies of all time. I've watched it countless times as a kid. What are your guys' favorite uh, John Woo movies? Um, I mean, for me, it's either this or Broken Arrow. To be honest, same. Yeah, um, really fun. I don't think Wind Talkers was was his genre at all. I don't think John Woo should be doing a World War Two movie. No, no. Uh, it, th these are th this is a guilty pleasure of mine. That uh, I mean, honestly, I haven't seen it in a while. But I, I this used to be on heavy rotation. I had this on DVD and VHS, uh, and it was this or Con Air or broken arrow that I was just kind of rotating through over and over again. Um, yeah. And the rock. Uh, late, yeah. The rock. <laughs> Fucking awesome. Uh, late nineties action movies, man. It was great. Um, Automata here says, uh, ah, face off. Here's to covering a great action movie. It's a cliche, but they really don't make them like that anymore. Any chance we'll see you hit up films like dark city, frailty, existence, virtuosity, or the 13th floor. <sighs> Oof. Give me time, man. I'll get through them. <laughs> it's just, it's, uh, uh, yeah, finding the opportunity. Um, John Ochiltree says, this stream uh, reminds me of peaches. I could eat a peach for hours. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't we all, my friend? Couldn't we all? Uh, Ecanalis, uh, hail drinker and Gary, uh, how the hell are you? I'll wait a minute. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, culture casino gave me a super sticker so thanks for that hey all culture uh, ross irving originally arnold schwarzenegger and sylvester stallone were in mind to play their lead roles god damn if that's true that would be a very different movie yes i don't think it would have worked uh yeah. as, nah it would have been just more just straight up action and this one was Ever, it was the scenes. I mean, like, I, you know, great explosions. The style was brilliant, but it was the scenes they played together. And just it was, yeah, the when Archer, when Troy is Archer's with the wife, it's stuff like that. That's great. Uh, it's the non action stuff that really makes it. So it's, it's so funny seeing like a criminal put into the, the body of like a, a, a cop with lots of power and influence and stuff and just seeing how he acts. And how he's just got no regard for rules or authority or anything, and he's just completely having the time of his life. You know, it's so fun to watch. It is. Uh, I, like you said, juxtaposition. There's tons of it in this movie, and it's brilliant. Heather Revezo says, really love that you two are discussing this. Well, we love it too, so thank you. Uh, Sheep in Moves Clothing. Drinker, when are you reviewing the Orville? Um, when I've reviewed enough episodes, sorry, when I've watched enough episodes that I've got a really good feel for the show, I just haven't had time yet, but I will get around to it. Uh, Big Fat Nerd says, that scene at the start with Cage dressed as a priest, it was so good. Typical Cage, his facial expressions made this movie. <laughs> they did. The, both of these guys get a chance to chew the scenery and have an absolute ball. And I think that's that's what makes it so fun. They're having fun and so are we. And it showed, like you said, it shows when they're having a blast doing it, and uh, and it 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 makes it just adds that extra layer. Yeah, uh, Louis the Plank. I could eat a peach for hours. Cheers to my favorite two channels. Thank you, um, and we're glad that we can entertain. Uh, 
Um, Terminus Est. Drinker, episode seven of The Boys was annoyingly woke. Yeah, I'm going to have to brave it. I'm going to have to watch it. Um, I'm not going to review it episode by episode, but I'll get to the end of season two and then just give my my overall thoughts. I yeah. just hope that it, it pulls it back a little bit. I hope so, too. I, I almost made a video just on episode seven. I'm like, I'll wait because I'm going to do a, a season thing. But, uh, I, you know, Jesus, it was cool. I, 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 a friend of mine messaged me and said, be ready. This is it. This is what we were worried about. And I'm like, oh, no. And uh, it went there. I can't yeah. wait to hear what you think about it. Yeah, I've got some thoughts already brewing, but I, I want to get a complete picture before I yeah, you know, before I put it out there. So we'll see. Um, John Bond here says, I could eat a peach for hours. <laughs> we all could. Um, that Germanic guy uh, donated two dollars, so thank you. Uh, Night King says, John Woo changed action movies in the 90s. The Matrix brought his style in the mainstream. Modern action as we see it, I think, was created by John Woo. Uh, yeah, it kind of goes back to that thing I was saying, like, you know, by the, the mid to late 90s, the 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 older style of action movies from the 80s of, of big muscly guys had kind of faded out. And so you got more, um, I guess, more relatable characters, more feasible kind of characters like Travolta and Cage, like they're not big, muscly guys. They're just regular people playing more um, character roles in an action movie setting. And the, the action is more stylized and um, and kind of um, more choreographed to be more kinetic. Uh, and that's what you get from guys like John Woo that you didn't get before. Yep. It's like action becoming more sophisticated, I suppose. So, yeah, I don't know if he was the cause of the change or if he was just an element of that change that was happening anyway. Maybe. I mean, it, it wouldn't have happened without him, though. So a, a key element, we'll say. Yep. Uh, Kupas says, hey, drinker and neurotic. Last time you spoke uh, a bit about Starship Troopers being a fascist government, it's not. Rico wasn't brainwashed by propaganda. Uh, well, I would argue against that, especially by the end of the movie. Um, I think the Rico that you see by the end of that film has been thoroughly indoctrinated into the the sort of fascist way of thinking. Um, but I would need to, like, to get my thoughts clearly on this one, I would probably need to rewatch it, really take the time to put out a proper review of it, uh, because it's a really interesting film that I'd love to talk about in more detail. Yeah, I would have to watch it again, too. Agreed. It, it's been a long time since I've given it a good proper watch. So, but yeah, it's definitely a film that's on my list. Um, Blazing Zev Zasevic says, um, got the first Ryan Dr sorry, the first Ryan Drake book today, hyped. Also, hi, uh, Trimmy. Trimmy. Um, well, I hope you enjoy my my first book. Um, it's it's been doing quite well recently, actually, since I, I made a mention of it in one of my my videos, and then suddenly. Um, it shoots up the rankings, so Isn't nice. Crazy how that happens. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jaffo here says, uh, if you two strip, I'll vote for you. Uh, we're not celebrities, though. We can't strip down. I'm already, um, I always live stream naked. It's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Drinker slash neurotic, make art great again, 2020. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was playing um, I was playing Modern Warfare with Az earlier like heels versus baby face and he was like i'm not gonna lie to you drinker i'm in my pants right now i was like ah excellent get your webcam on as and uh we'll do we'll do a stream together <laughs> i see as with some tidy whiteys playing modern yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's really good by the way he's like a fucking aggressive player when you do um war zone like you know some people just hide for like the majority of the match and then like come out of hiding at the end when the circle's closed in he's just right in there from the get-go it's great i mean we both died within like the first five minutes but that was cool yeah that i mean that's how i play when i rarely play a video game i die quick because i i just i don't know all the uh the strategery i'll use a, a george bush word there the strategery i just yeah. don't guns a blazing or axes a blazing um 
Kubis here says, uh, Rico becomes an inspiring, capable leader through real experiences. The media is heavily propag propagandized, but so is the media today in our democracies. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, very propagandized. Um, and I think it's very partisan. Um, yes. the, the BB, I, like, I know you won't get this in America, but the BBC is like our main news outlet in the UK. And holy crap, that has become you know, tribalistic as shit. Yeah. I saw, uh, that video from Trafalgar square or, you know, take down the BBC. Uh, I was yeah. crazy. There was a lot of people there. So every I, so often uh, defund the BBC is, is on the, the, is on trending on Twitter. Yep. I'm down with that. Um, we have like four networks we need to take out here. Uh, and th well, three, we'll just say three and a half of them pretty much toe the line, the, the system line. And, uh, that's why we have Tim pool. That's why we have, uh, YouTube right now, quite frankly, because yeah. people feel like they're not being told the entire story. Yeah. At least your taxpayer dollars don't pay for your TV networks though. So. Oh, that would be so enraging. It, it, it is. It really is. Um, especially when you see some of the shite they put out now, like it's so it's like, yeah, it's just trying to indoctrinate you into the cult of woke, you know, and people will buy it. Um, Kubis also says you really should check out the two animated movies of Starship Troopers Invasion and Traitors of Mars. The CGI is top notch. Yeah, see, after the original Starship Troopers, like they, they did produce a bunch of other movies. Like there was a couple of direct to DVD sequels. And then, yeah, I think there's some animated stuff as well, but I've not seen, I've not seen the second movie. I've seen the third one, but I haven't seen any of the animated stuff. Yeah, I haven't either. Maybe that's something I'll watch when, when you know, 30 hour day. As soon as that pops up, I'll have that extra time I need. Yeah. Uh, the Night King here says, why is Castor Troy a better husband than Archer? Lol. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's the thing. Like, it's very easy to be an amazing husband, I suppose, for a couple of days because you're new to it. But like, to do it um, every day for like ten years, twenty years, thirty years—that's probably the harder part. And you know, Sean Archer is obviously wrestling with the the grief of the loss of his son and, and his pursuit of um, Castor Troy. So those are the things that put the strain on the marriage. It's not like him being just a bad husband in general. I don't think yeah it's yeah it's complicated it's just more of uh you know you lost your kid and most more marriages don't survive that by the way and this one did just because he was laser focused on this miss mission to get him and you you saw the and, and listen it could have been a lot worse we just had a, a daughter going through a pretty normal phase uh just amped up a little bit that thick eyeliner man watch out for that uh yeah uh, i think it's it's interesting and, and yeah i don't want to get a big thing about marriage but uh when for them to last a long time a lot has to happen a lot of growth fights and uh, counseling sometimes but uh they do sometimes they do last yep. if you're on your second one <laughs> <laughs> Um, Ross Irvin here says, you'll be seeing a lot of changes around here. Papa's got a brand new bag. Yeah. Ow! Uh, yeah, great scene. Love it. Travolta just loving his life. Um, Charlie Vu's here says, I think Dark Knight Rises is not good or great, but decent. However, I hear a lot of people saying it's awful. Where do you think it falls and why? I think it's okay. It's definitely not great. Uh, it's not a terrible film, but like the the pacing of it is awful. Um, the 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 character motivations of the antagonists don't make much sense. It's just a real step down from Dark Knight for me, anyway. Same here. I think um, it was an uh, obligatory movie. I'm not too sure Nolan was well. He wasn't going to take that path, and then Heath Ledger died and changed everything, and they had to kind of probably change it on the fly. And yeah, there was a lot of mistakes made in that movie too. Uh, and yeah, it's just implausible in some areas, but, uh, considering what we've seen over the last six or seven months, it, 
you know, because that's the one thing I couldn't buy. This was supposed to be a grounded thing. And then oh, who would take over a city? Nobody could take over a city. And then I went, oh, they can. So yeah. we, you know. <laughs> just as we've seen, just <laughs> ask the good people of Portland. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, maybe Portland needs a Batman, you know? <sighs> yeah, they need something, man. Um, apparently, the the there's like an Antifa um, representative who's leading the polls for the next mayor in November. Like, like, fucking hell. Like, will you literally not help yourselves if this is the kind of person you're going to vote for? Ah, it'd be an empty city. Uh, yeah, that's just, I mean, that's that's the politics. Of, it's crazy. And that's, oh, God. We really have to pay attention who we vote in local office. I wasn't. I don't think a lot of us were. To be honest with you, we're you know, uh, mayors would get voted in on on you know on a, thousands of votes in a city with millions of people, uh, and I think everybody's starting to wake up to maybe, and I, I include myself in this. We should pay a little more attention to those local elections. Yep, uh, I just I can't imagine living in such extreme, like uh, uh, such an extreme political climate. I guess. Like to, to have that stuff happening on a daily basis, it's just, it's insanity. It really is. Over in the, you know, UK for back in the eighties, uh, there was a lot of crazy stuff going on there, but I, yeah, I don't know if it's like this. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird because, you know, the, I don't li w listen to the news. I, I don't turn on the mainstream media at all, but, uh, if, if you did regularly, you would think everything is falling apart, but you know, I just kind of keep it focused to where I live right now and people are going to work and uh, there's traffic on the streets. The traffic lights work. The power grid works. My internet works. Uh, and the, the only weird thing is my kid uh, going to school on zoom every day. And it's, it's incredibly difficult for him. Uh, oh, the school's still closed for you guys. Yeah. It's, it's, it's insane. I, I don't want to take over this thing with it, but uh, my kids having a, you know, a, a lot of kids are having a hard time with it. And it's, it's, uh, you know, we're basically, we should write this year off. I mean, a lot of kids are going to have to repeat grades who wouldn't have repeated grades before. And um, I don't think it's very fair to them at all, but uh, Jesus. See, that's the, <clears throat> they are at least um, kind of even handed here with that sort of thing. They've, they've basically said, look, if, if we have, you know, if we have to start closing things down again, like the schools will be the last thing to shut Good. because we recognize how important it is that they they stay open um, and they can get an education and stuff. So, you know, <clears throat> they've put like tighter restrictions on pubs and restaurants and stuff at the moment because the, the numbers are going up, but um, schools, they're not touching generally. Good. It's good to hear that. <clears throat> they They need that normalization too. You know, I yeah. mean, this is traumatic as hell on them. So, uh, and they're watching the adults acting like a bunch of flaming idiots. And, uh, it's, it, it, it shakes you, you know, I mean, like I'm part of a generation that grew up during the cold war, which was bad enough, you know, but this is worse. Honestly, this is, this is way worse. Cause at least I was still going to school. And I think in the back of all our minds, we're like, they wouldn't really press the button. Would they? Well, at least during the Cold War, your enemy was behind a border on the other side of the world. Now, well, <laughs> it's kind of everywhere. No, no. Like when I go to a restaurant now and, and I bring my kid with me, I, you know, you got to have your head on a swivel. And like, I, you know, I grew up like that. So I, I know what it's like. But, um, you know, having your kid around now and, and you know, you just never know. Uh, and it, it's generally fine. Again, most people are being perfectly polite to each other and people are throwing on their masks to go into a, a, a rest, you know, a restaurant or a store. I'm, I haven't seen any Karens yelling at people. I haven't seen, you know, you see the chin diaper once in a while and I don't, you know, like however you feel about the mask, it's like, whatever, that's fine. I'm, that's fine. Yeah. Um, if some dickhead tried to get fucking lecture me like about wearing a mask or whatever, I'd be like, yeah. Um, okay meet my forehead right now it's going to yeah. come into contact with your face anytime exactly. now exactly it's like i do not need to have some fucking random arsehole to lecture me about what i should be doing like i generally like i'm fairly conscientious about stuff like that but like there's common sense and then there's just being a dick exactly you know i i i the businesses ask me to throw it on i throw it on 
to go in the business. I, I'm not going to cause any trouble in there, but um, it's off as soon as I walk out. Uh, it's like walking around on the street with nobody around me. I'm not going to wear it. Like there's nobody around me uh, in the gym. I'll fine. I'll wear it. If it get, if it allows me to work out and do something normal, fine. But, uh, but it's off as soon as I'm out. So, and it depends on how you feel about that. I don't think uh, I, I, nobody's yelled at me about it, but if they did, I would probably have the same response. Like, See here, you don't have to wear them in gyms. Like you, you maybe have to wear them going through a reception area like to get to the changing rooms and stuff. But then once you're in the gym, like that's it, you're fine. Like they, all they ask is that you wipe down the equipment once you're done, which I guess you would do anyway. Yeah. You uh, yeah. Cause like, <laughs> I would, I wouldn't want to be like, you know, lifting weights or running or whatever with a mask on. It's like fucking hell. It's hard enough as it is like trying to breathe. Yeah. It's, and I get fogged cause I wear glasses. So it gets fogged up. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. They make you wear it. And I think, um, I don't know. I've never tried. I think if I pulled it off, they wouldn't care. Uh, cause I mean, th th we're pretty far apart in there. The, they, they take, if it gets too crowded, they take appointments. Um, and you get you, your little time slot and it's worked out. Okay. Uh, but it, it's, yeah, California is still pretty bad. Yeah. And I mean, I'm in the most free part. What, uh, as far as big cities are concerned, I'm in the, the freest one. Like it's uh, San Diego is not as bad as LA or San Francisco. It's pretty open down here. Yeah, you guys got like a Republican mayor, though, haven't you, in San Diego? Yeah. Uh, see, that makes things easier, doesn't it? Makes it a lot different. Um, Robley1066 here says, picked up a copy of Redemption today. Looks good so far. Good. I hope you enjoy it. Um, I wrote the shit out of that book. Although my, it's my, my final one is um, called Something to Die For. That's the one I put, like, I would say is the best I've done. Um, that's the best I can write a book ever. So hopefully it turns out well. Um, Ross Irving says, plan B, <laughs> why don't we just kill each other? <laughs> yeah, that's a great line. Um, Cloud61592, uh, Drinker slash Gary, you guys are both awesome. Don't you all think John Travolta did good in From Paris with Love? Also, The Boys Season 2 sucks. Um, I haven't seen from Paris with love myself. Um, I don't know if you have, Gary. I have not. Yeah. Um, another Travolta movie we should watch. Uh, but yeah, I'm not loving season two so far. Um, Big Dave K here says, Hey, a drinker, do you think you might ever do reviews of animated films or are we sticking with live action for the most part? No, I mean, I'd be happy to do live, uh, sorry, animation. Um, if I find the right film, I want to talk about it. Um, I've, when I did my review of Mulan, uh, I kind of drew parallels between that and the animated version. And the animated version's way better. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm, you know, I'm happy to talk about that in, when it's relevant, pretty much. Uh, La Lady Gravemaster. <clears throat> you guys are amazing, and so is this film. I'd say Face Off and Broken Arrow, sorry, Broken Arrow are rivals for my favorite 90s uh, John Woo action film. Hard Target is also epic. All of that is true. Yes. Hi, Lady Greymaster. Um, uh, I'm probably going to end up watching uh, Broken Arrow tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's worth it for that fucking theme tune, man. Honestly, yeah. down, 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 down. Mm. Oh man, it's just cool. Um, yeah, I like that for movie. Um, Pink Callow, the driving ape, gave me a thumbs up. Super sticker, so thank you for that. Um, Hazel Trom says, "Get drunk." This is false advertising. Like, I'm doing my best, honestly. Like I'm, I'm I probably getting on for halfway through a bottle of rum right now, but I'm able to just keep functioning. Um, and that's the best I can say. That's why I keep mis misreading all of these uh, super chats because my ability to use my talking mouth is starting to fail. Trouble with it's over, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on yeah, place. you got no excuse, man. Nope. <laughs> no. Um, Pack thirteen here says, uh, "Have you guys planned a live stream with EFAP around Halloween?" Uh, I haven't yet. Um, I'm still convinced that Christmas is better than Halloween, but uh, I'll, I'll talk with Mauler and see if he wants to do something. Um, Automata here says, uh, but, you're, but you're still not having any fun. 
Right. In the words of Caster Troy, um, Mark C. Gina Gershon. Mm, never before or since have I wanted to convert one to our team. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she is, yeah, she's pretty. I'll give her that. Um, Hi Ice 007 says, Drinker, is there any chance you'll do a critique of the spoiled rich kid Samantha from Cobra Kai like you did Admiral Holdo? That was epic, by the way. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed that one. Um, right from when I first saw Last Jedi, I was like, man, this really reminds me of Crimson Tide, but not in a good way. Like, it's like a horrible like, ripoff of that dynamic. Um, Samantha from Cobra Kai. I don't know if she really stands up to that level of like character analysis. Um, yeah, I would need to rewatch it and see. Um, Protege music. This whole movie is a meme, down to Nick Cage pausing in between Face Off, or even the fact that every John Woo uh, has doves in every movie. Great show, guys, picking up the Nathan Drake series. It's Ryan Drake, not Nathan Drake. <laughs> Nathan Drake is something else entirely. Uh, but I am glad you're enjoying it. It's Drake. But no, Nathan Drake is uh, a video game, right? Yeah, the Uncharted series. Uncharted, that's right. I don't know. I mean, so. there's, a, there's a little reference in one of my books where someone asks the main character, Ryan Drake, about like a cousin or something from America. And he's like, yeah, he's into archaeology or something, but he's an asshole. Uh, and then he's like, I don't want to talk about him anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. I can't, I'm going to get, uh, I'm, you know, as beat me to it, I got to get your big stack of books. I still got to buy that. So I'll, I'll be doing oh, Yeah, that. he got them all, man. Like I was, uh, I was shocked. Um, well, for not doing it sooner. So I apologize. No, no, it's cool. Uh, Did you know the, the Jurassic Park reference? Uh, I got it from the the trivia thing on the side of Amazon Prime. Like <clears throat> when they were hiding on the, it was inside the prison. They were hiding behind some uh, crates, and on the crate was the company that did the cloning of the dinosaurs. InGen. And, yes, InGen. Yes, that's it. So. The, oh, that's brilliant! I love it. There's I love the, the I love the idea. I, I want to face off slash Jurassic Park crossover. That they're would be incredible. They're in the same world. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, the Justice Thirty Five here says, "Loved your review of the Thing, Drinker." Um, Kurt Russell and his beard are national treasures. Yes, they are. Uh, what vids do you have in the works? And what do you think you'll? Uh, sorry. And do you think you'll review shows like Gundam, IBO, or Trigun? Damn. Um, I'm still working on my my um, drinker fixies Finn from um, from Last Jedi because I felt really bad for for John Boyega. Like you could see his frustration at how his character was treated, and I was like, right, I'm going to fix Finn. I'm going to try and give him the character arc he never got. Um, but it's been way fucking harder than I expected. Like when I tried to fix Ray. I had to rewrite the entire plot for like The Force Awakens, so this is kind of equally demanding, and it's just taking time. Um, I'm also planning to do more horror movies since it's uh, it's October, so there's a few more of them in the works. I really want to do um, The Mouth of Madness because mm -hmm. I really think that's a totally underrated and underappreciated horror film. I totally agree. Absolutely, it's, it, it's worth it for Sam Neil screaming again. <laughs> I just love him. <laughs> um uh what's this one romu 42 says i love the church scene with nick cage and the doves we all we all love that yeah that's that's what makes john woo movies the doves uh thasio says damn drinker did you get cirrhosis on your face yeah this is my halloween look i hope you like it um, someone did uh, did me the credit of zombifying me so i had to i had to use it um i've dated worse than this to be honest so it's not it's not too bad this is scotland we're talking about here <laughs> uh ret one here says i saw this in the theater back in the day and i just couldn't buy into the premise plus it's a travolta movie it was not fine <laughs> but uh, i think if you embrace it as the the a bit of a joke then it's great um you'll have a good laugh with it um, La Brian Lewandowski says, "Do search for Spock next." Bones, what have I done? Well, there we go. The, the gauntlet's been thrown down. Yeah, 
Um, I genuinely like Search for Spock. Um, I think it's a, an underrated Star Trek movie, and I referenced it when I did my review of um, uh, Star Trek Beyond because it starts to rip off um, elements from Search for Spocks, and that pissed me off. Yeah, because they couldn't think of anything original, so they thought they would just rip off el elements from the other third Star Trek movie, and this is how much they think about stuff. I mean, for Christ's sake, when you rewrite, when you rewrote, uh, you know, Ray's character, that was, you put more work into that than, than they did. Uh, and if you do Boyega, you'll do twice as much work as they put in to those damn movies. And that's, that's the, I mean, like the heart of the problem before we even get to the agenda aspect of it, it's they're freaking lazy. They're so lazy now, uh, because they don't want to take any risks and it, you know, it was falling apart before all this stuff happened. Uh, I think we were all seeing it. And now, I mean, it's change or die with Hollywood, honestly. And I think a lot of us have figured out over the last six or seven months that, oh, there's a bunch of old movies that I'd rather watch again, or I haven't seen, or a bunch of, there's tons of books I haven't read. And uh, I've been hearing that more and more. So uh, hopefully they'll think of that, or we'll figure out other ways to entertain ourselves. We tend to do that. Absolutely. This is the advantage of having like 50 years of uh, back catalog. Yep. thousands of movies that we could watch um there'll be people listening to this that have never watched half the movies that i've reviewed but like that's fine go watch them you'll get a lot of entertainment out of them generally like way more than you do nowadays oh um, yeah. and it's like yeah i'm happy to keep drawing attention to these older films that are really fucking good and just fun um rather than the shite we have to deal with now like i'm happy to tear them apart but like i would never recommend them no um Protégé Music says, Drinker, I meant to ask you to do a review of John Bernthal as The Punisher. I felt it would actually be a great collaboration between you and Nerd you and Nerdrotic. Um, yeah, I love John Bernthal as The Punisher. He, he roars like nobody else. He is. Uh, he was criminally underused in uh, season two of The Punisher. I thought season one was okay, and he was brilliant in Daredevil season two. Uh, I was yep. just be it, it, you know and i've liked all versions of the punisher by the way um and ray stevenson uh came to my shop and we did a premiere for um uh war zone which was brilliant and tom jane's my favorite i thought his punisher was great and, but bernthal he's still around i mean they could still do it but it's disney so you think you yeah. really can get a good punisher and and while well, he's a little they consider him a little fascist now so, not sure if he'll. Really I thought he was pretty woke. Yeah, but uh, the character. Uh, they uh, think the character yeah. the Punisher represents, you know, I'm trying to use their mindset. It makes no sense to the normal person who understands what the Punisher is, but uh, they don't. So, yeah, I, I, the, some of the flashback scenes that you got when he was in Afghanistan were just brilliant. Like, yeah, you just love that kind of, um, that, that, pushing yourself on beyond your physical limits uh you know you see him like after the mission and he spits up blood into a like a, a like a cup or whatever like because he's been that fucked up by what he's been doing like that is just brilliant loved it um what's the next one here carlos garcia thanks for the hours of entertainment drinker question what's your favorite book to movie adaptation and what do you think of the cast of the resident evil reboot uh so Probably my favorite book to movie adaptation would be Jurassic Park. Um, I think, yeah, fantastic movie. And I referenced it when I did my um, Jurassic World review. It's like how smart that original movie was compared to the new one um, and how it dealt actually with interesting ideas, whereas the new one just gave us nothing at all. Um, I don't know much about the Resident Evil reboots um, at this point, so I couldn't tell you. Um, I have heard that it's a bit closer to the games and it's going to be a bit more faithful to them. So fingers crossed, because I fucking love the games more than any normal person should. They became my obsession for a long time. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Farewell Thunderchild here says, if they did it, which two actors would be best in a modern remake to replace Cage and Travolta? Also, Gary, do you know the War of the Worlds musical? Um, I don't. I wouldn't replace Cage or Travolta. I would never remake this movie. It doesn't need it. It was fine the way it was. 
don't do it. Just come up with new ideas. Yeah, because there's there's no equivalent. If I thought there was, if this was uh, uh, like a normal Hollywood, like if they had progressed normally, they might have had a couple of equivalents out there right now, but there isn't. Those are two very unique actors that we will never see their their the likes of them again. Uh, and I couldn't think of anybody uh, like seriously. Um, uh, like Tom Hardy is the only like actor I can think of off the top of my head that I would go see a movie he was in or Christian Bale. Uh, but that, then it would just be, I don't know. I, it just wouldn't be the same. It, yeah. it would be way more serious. Very much agree. Um, Automata here says, remember that the bomb is named Sinclair. Yeah. I think we talked about that earlier. And she, she gets her boobs out if you, just, if you uh, disarm her. So excellent. Yeah. Um, Craig Cooper, uh, hi, I'm from Australia. Face Off was a really good movie. I'm an independent author. I like writing about the value of fathers and hard work. I self-published my first novel last year, and I've got signed copies at cscooper.com.au. Uh, no, excellent stuff, man. Uh, I'm glad that you've you've got your books out there, and uh, I wish you the best of luck with it. Um, these are themes that I think uh, we could definitely do more of um, in, in entertainment. Um, CJT gave me a, a pie, a slice of pie, super sticker. So thank you. Um, King Hess says, hey, drinker, Gary, love your work. A random question. Would either of you review Goonies or Troy? Also, Disney killed theaters. Um, yeah, yes. uh, I would review the Goonies for sure. I I would either of those movies. I would. Sure. I saw Goonies in theaters when it came out. Damn. Yeah, I'm old. I got to, that's the only thing I want to do. <laughs> they didn't have as many movies as they did now, but uh, we went every every Friday almost for like a day. Yeah, there's certain films I just wish I'd, I could see in a cinema. Like, I want to see Back to the Future, or Star Wars, that sort of thing. Like, yeah, in a proper movie theater, be awesome. Um, that's where it belongs. Automata here says, "If you're so, if you're Sean Archer, then I guess I'm Caster Troy." Yep, <laughs> good yep. line. Uh, Joe here says, "Rags sucks." Rags isn't even in this in this uh, live stream to rebut that one. That's a bit harsh, man. Um, Automata here says, "Dress up like Halloween, and ghouls will try to get in your pants." <laughs> yeah, uh, good line from Travolta there. Yep. Um, Larry, Larry gave me a super sticker thumbs up. So thanks. Um, Automata says, what? You look like you just fucked your mother. <laughs> yeah, that's a line from Dietrich. Yeah. Uh, yeah, another good one. Um, 200 Watt Studio. Gary, Expanse returns on December the 16th. No shit. Really? The season? Apparently. They got it fi finished. All right. Um, well, okay. Here's going to be the, uh, the party line for a little while. I hope it doesn't go woke. Certainly hope not. Do you feel like it's trending in that direction? Yep. Damn. And I love that show. And and uh and I, I know not everybody does, uh, but I do. Uh I think it, uh, it was it's it, like really the first two seasons are amazing. They're brilliant. Uh they had to rush the third a little bit. That was my only complaint about it because they thought they were getting canceled. And then last season was pretty good was pretty good. I, I don't have any major complaints because Tom Jane's in it. He I, Either than Tom Jane wasn't in it enough, in my opinion. But um, this should be the best season because it's based on the best book. Okay. Fingers so, crossed then. Um, Douglas Barton says, sorry, Burton here says, Drinker and Nerdrotic, which specific movie made you realize that it was officially time to step up and save Western civilization from bad writing? Uh yeah, for me, it was Last Jedi. That's when it just crossed that that critical mass, and I was I realized like, oh my god, this is awful. They are ruining everything that used to be awesome, um, and I don't understand why they're doing it. And then later, I kind of did understand, uh, and that's that's what really spurred me into action. Yeah, for me, um, it took me a bit because uh, so I saw the Last Jedi, and I was so. Pissed. I never wanted to talk about Star Wars again. I was just like, it's dead to me. I'm never going to talk about it again. I don't want to. I don't want to even give it that bump. And then, um, 
at the same time, the Doctor Who thing was happening. So it was both of those things that got me into it. But yep. Doctor Who was like the straw that broke the camel's back, to be honest with you. After watching the annoying that. thing is like yeah. you you end up second guessing yourself because you start seeing this kind of thing in everything, like movies, TV shows, and stuff, and you you have to keep asking yourself like, okay, am I just being over sensitive to this stuff, or is it really there? And you yeah. try to be as objective as possible about it and and be charitable in how you look at it, but even then, it's it's still there, and it results in really detrimental quality. You know, it really destroys the quality of the writing when it, you try to push stuff like this all the time. It absolutely does. And and I was still giving shows a chance uh, very recently. But honestly, the, the boys uh, episode seven was uh, almost demoralizing to the point where, like, I'm now going to just expect everything to be woke like absolutely everything like the next Marvel movie, the next DC movie. Uh, I know even stuff that didn't show signs of it before. I'm just going to expect it to be there. And if it's not, then I'll be pleasantly surprised, you know, and, and now I'm gravitating towards like the movies can't even be that don't even have to be that good. You know, I always break out the example of Aquaman Aquaman's like, um, it's, it's a summary schlocky movie right but i didn't hate it because they didn't preach at me in an aquaman movie uh and the fact that i enjoyed an aquaman movie more than i enjoyed uh any single marvel movie is kind of amazing uh but i did now the next one will probably woke as hell but you know who knows but that yeah that it's it's just been, been this progression and after you watch it happen to star trek star wars doctor who marvel comics and everything else it's uh it's harder and harder to root for stuff, something that I've loved my entire life. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. It's, so we, we try to save it. We do what we can. Cause if you, if you're quiet, nothing's going to happen. I mean, there's always the criticism out there of why don't you just move on? Why don't you just move on? Well, it, you know, if I was that kind of person, um, I wouldn't be on YouTube doing what I do. I wouldn't have, um, had a comic store, uh, the drinker wouldn't write books, uh, creativity, entertainment, pop culture. This, these things are in our blood, you know, it's part of our lives. It's our modern mythology and it's important. Uh, and yeah. And it's, it's, it's like, if someone burns down your house and you're looking at the, the ruins, like, oh shit, man, like this is, uh, this is really messed up things for me. And then someone just comes along and says, well, why don't you just move on? It's like, yeah, but I had kind of a lot invested in this, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't want to just see it burn to the ground and and not do anything about it. Right. Uh, oh, God! In a bigger picture, that's what my country's kind of in that position right now. Yeah, yeah. A lot of us, a lot of us want to move on. They don't want to deal with the trouble, deal with the deal with the the complication, uh, the confrontation. But we have to. There's a point where you have to. Yeah. Um, Tim Jim here says, just finished all six the, of the original series uh, Star Trek movies last night uh, after being inspired by your Wrath of Khan discussion. And I absolutely loved Kirk's fire at the end. Yeah. Yes. Uh, nobody can clench his fist and yell fire like Captain Kirk. Just awesome. Um, I'm really looking forward to meeting William Shatner um, early next year. Hopefully that still goes ahead. Like, <laughs> fuck knows what's going to happen. I, I hope. I think it will. I, I just think um, I could be wrong. But after the election, I think things will change. Yep. Um, but yeah, he's going to be in Edinburgh. Um, so I'm going to be going over to see him um, doing a special presentation of Wrath of Khan. So should be good. Um, Oki Native or Oki Native says, uh, from a scale of one to quickly down under, how would you rank Face Off? I think quickly down under is meant to be the best movie ever. So I, I put Face Off as like a seven or an eight um, in terms of the amount of fun you can have with it. Eight for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love it. I, I um, it is in uh, like, if, if it was one of those movies that it used to be on cable a lot and I'd be doing something, I would stop what I was doing. And there's, there's very few movies I'll do that with. Like I'll stop what I'm doing and I'll watch the rest of it. Even if I catch it halfway through and it's like, a, you know, if like the Godfather comes on and that's, you know, 
that's an investment of time. But if the Godfather's on and my eye catches it, I stop and I start, you know, I watch it. And same goes for Broken Arrow. Uh, like I said before, The Rock, uh, Con Air. I love these movies. Even Armageddon. I even oh, like- yeah. That is my guilty pleasure of all of all guilty pleasures. Um, that movie is dumb as fuck and like makes no sense, but it's fun. And it, it, it gets all the emotional chords going. Like, yeah, it's, it's a good, fun movie. And it's it's just enjoyable to watch, like you say. Um, lens flares before there was lens flares. It's magic hour, like all the time. You know, <laughs> it's so. <yeah>. Good. <laughs> um, Matt guy here says, Gary, have you got round to Red Dwarf review yet? Not yet. Well, have you? No, I need to. I'm sorry. Uh, you know what? I'm probably going to have time. Uh, well, Star Trek's coming up. But I was going to say, like, there's not a ton of news happening, which really gets in the way of a lot of my reviews, to be honest with you. Um, and uh, if the mo- if the news starts uh, lightening up a little bit, then uh, it allows me more time to. I've got to finish my Picard review, though. Once I do that, I can I can move on to other things. But the the move screwed that up, completely screwed that up. Yeah, are you doing it on an episode by episode basis, like Picard? Yeah, Oh, sorry. That's, um, I had a really hard time. I'd like, see, I, I don't have the talent of certain YouTubers, so I can't like uh, succinctly make my point in 15 minutes on an entire series. So I'm like the way I used to review series is episode by episode. So I would just break down the episode. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do. It's going to be long probably. And I'm just going to do it my style and hopefully it works, but there is so many ridiculously stupid things that happen in that. And I, I want to catch them all. I want to just point out like all the plot holes and because the, the criticism I get a lot is I just hate things. They hate it. It's like, no, no, I'll tell you exactly why I hate Picard. There are reasons. There are legit reasons from uh, story reasons and agenda reasons. And I can separate them both. And I can tell you right now, if there was no agenda in Picard, I would hate the show anyway, because it was just stupid. And, uh, but I mean, the agenda is so intertwined to what happened to the main character. Uh, it's, it, and it's just a complete systematic deconstruction. So they actually had to try to fail this hard. I, that's why I, I kind of call Picard the perfect failure. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I tried to sum up all the reasons why I thought it was a failure in, in a video, but like, even then I could have made it twice as long easily. You know, there's there's so much to it, and it's not not since Luke Skywalker in Last Jedi have I seen a character destroyed so thoroughly as that that show. Yeah, and your video was genius, by the way. You, you yours and Red Letter Media's were were therapeutic. You know, it actually they, I think they're helpful. I think that's why you get so many damn views because you're good. But it also you understand why at the end you're like, oh, for one, I'm not alone. And, uh, you're a voice that people trust that, that a lot of people trust and should, because you're, you, I, I think you're really objective and, uh, and you also understand storytelling. You're a writer. So you understand in ways I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm completely a reader. <laughs> so I am a reader. I sold a few books in my time, but I wouldn't know how to write. And, uh, that's, that's the, I think that's the thing that you and uh, red letter media bring to the table that uh, well, a lot of people don't. What I love about their review is that apparently that actually scuppered a deal with uh, with Paramount and, and CBS. Like they were on track to get some investors on board for like Strange New Worlds or, or whatever the next like show they had in mind was. And that actually like that their review was so scathing and so uh, destructive that it actually scuppered that deal. <laughs> I just think that's brilliant. That is- <laughs> cool. I I could believe that they pay attention to this stuff now. They they really do. Um, and I've heard that from the horse's mouth and, and something, you know, red letter media, when you guys drop a video, they pay attention to that stuff. It, it catches, uh, they understand the sway you guys have, uh, and, and you have it because you have the people's trust. Yeah. Was that, and they need, and, and, you know, at first they're going to deny what you say, you know, that they're going to go through their whole process, but then eventually somebody's going to listen. Hopefully that's our hope. And I think some people are, they're just not people with power right now. I hope that what they would see is like, 
none of us go into it just with the mindset of I hate this thing and I'm just going to find reasons to pick holes in it. It's like, you know, we, we come at it from a position of, of loving the franchise or, or really appreciating what it's done in the past and just feeling dismayed at the direction it's going now, you know, and we, yeah. you know, I certainly try to justify why it's going wrong now by like giving examples of how it did it better in previous installments. You know, this is why it worked then. This is why it doesn't work now. I'm not trying to do this just to shit on everything that you produce. It's like, we think you're just going really wrong here. This is how you need to try and fix it. Um, yeah, it'd be great if, to think that some of them would take notice of that. Who knows? You know? No, I would love to be reviewing a good television show. I, and the numbers would be equal. I, I've, I've got proof of that. You know, I, I mean, I got, you know, just on my dumb live reviews, right. I, I did pretty well on the Orville and I liked all of those episodes. They all equaled when I was crapping on star Trek discovery. So I I'm completely okay with reviewing something good and I try to give it. And, and I know you do too. Everybody No, like with Picard, I knew Kurtzman was involved, but I still had a little ray of hope. I'm like, God, maybe this can at least be mediocre. You know, I'd be okay with mediocre. Um, but it wasn't so, but yeah, it de we're not definitely trying, wasn't we're trying to enjoy this stuff, to be honest with you. Um, What's the next one? Louis de Plank here says, would you guys ever consider doing They Live live stream? <laughs> that is a film I haven't seen in a while, but I remember it for the epic fight scenes in it. Uh, yeah, totally down. Roddy Piper, um, when I was into wrestling, he was my guy. I loved Rowdy Roddy Piper. May he rest in peace. Yeah, wow, what a guy. Um, Walt here says, don't know if you heard, but South Africa is about to go down in flames. Um, I'm going to make a fellow Saffer, Richard Stanley, and disappear into the jungle. <laughs> yeah, Richard Stanley was the director originally for The Island of Dr. Moreau. Oh. Um, and everything basically went wrong in that film. He pretty much um, got fired from the production because he couldn't manage any of his stars like Marlon Brando and, and uh, Val Kilmer. So he promptly lost his mind and destroyed the entire set and then just disappeared into the jungle and had a nervous breakdown, uh, which is epic. Um, and he even snuck back onto the set dressed as an extra so that he could spy on what the, <sighs> the new director was doing. That's great. That was great. Guy. Right? Oh, I remember hearing that nightmarish stuff. Um, but, you know, this was, God, that was a long time ago, so you didn't know what to believe. I could believe yeah. that Martin Brando and Val Kilmer would be a two major pains in the ass yeah both absolute dickheads both extremely difficult to work with um you put the two of them together they just they went to war with each other on that film apparently but um, val Kilmer, by all rights should have been an a-list star and he was yeah. on that trajectory and it was his personality that kept him from being that so and he, dude he's been in some um salt and sea is one of my favorite all-time movies i don't know if you've seen it or not but it is great it is dark. Um, there's a area right close to me now called the Salton Sea here in California. It's kind of a giant fake salt lake that was made by mistake. The Colorado River, they were damming it up or something like that, and it it, uh, it broke, and it made this like big lake in a basin where there used to be an ancient lake, and then they uh, so it. But it's like this really bizarro place to go. So it's like where a lot of you know, uh, a lot of people used to cook meth out there, used to go out and like make drugs out there. And it used to be just the all drug culture and it's just and desert culture. It's really bizarre. It's hard to explain. So yeah. it's about, um, this, the saxophone player who, uh, gets into the meth underworld to investigate the murder of his wife. It's got Vincent D'Onofrio. He plays a drug dealer who's missing his nose. So he's got a prosthetic nose and there's a scene where they reenact. We were just talking about this reenact the Kennedy assassination with, um, with electric trains and chickens and <laughs> it is a really good movie but it's bizarre uh i highly recommend it and uh, okay. he's and al kilmer is great in it he is great in it yeah i mean you know he obviously had that period like um in the early 90s where he did like he was in the batman movies he was in heat stuff like that just you know, good, well, not Batman, that wasn't a good movie, but it was a high-profile movie that, that yep. really made him um, aware 
um, and kind of raised him to that level. But yeah, like you say, I think his his personality and his work ethic was horrendous. He, nobody wanted to work with him, and it just absolutely destroyed his career. Yep. Um, shame. Yeah, I think he had and potential. Then, uh, the Doors. Um, I, I mean, I I usually don't like biopic picks, but I love it's Oliver Stone. And I love the doors and he was great as Jim Morrison. So after I saw him in that, I'm like, man, this dude's going to win Academy Awards. He's going to go play, but he just didn't. And yeah. we knew why, because he was an a-hole. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, he also says, uh, you should get in touch with Count Dankula. would be so cool to hear you two chat. Uh, yeah. I mean, I follow him on, on Twitter. I don't think he follows me though. So I don't even know if he's aware that I exist. Um, uh, and I'm not sure what part of Scotland he's from. I'm pretty sure he's the central belt like me, uh, based on his accent. But I, I don't know whereabouts he is. Um, but one day, who knows? Uh, Eric K. Uh, Gary, you're onto something. The hive mind makes them all go pee at the same time. It does. <laughs> this is about women having the, the hive mind mentality. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, can't miss out on those precious few minutes of gossiping time, I guess. Um, Automata also says no, no daughter of mine would shoot so wide yeah another good <laughs> line from Travolta um, James Burchill Broken Arrow part 2 of John Woo's infatuation with John Travolta um, or was it part 1 either way nah it'll be fine uh, yeah it was part 1 like uh, Broken Arrow came in 96 and I think Face Off was 97 so that was the that was the sequence um, and you could tell that uh, Broken Arrow wasn't fully formed as a John Woo movie because I'm pretty sure there was no doves in it. Tragedy. Yeah. Maybe uh, there wasn't in the budget. Yeah. Uh, happy birthday, Polly. Here says, uh, Drinker, you Christmas harlot. If they made a sequel to Face Off with a third actor similar to Travolta and Cage into the mix, who would you choose? Ooh. Damn. So, like, Travolta and Cage were back. Who would we put in as a third guy? As a third guy? Bruce Willis? I'm going to say Chris Pratt for a, a bit of young oh, talent. Yeah, yeah, that would be, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, because Chris Pratt is more, uh, you know, because I always want to go to Tom Hardy or Christian Bale, but they're both, like, very serious actors. I think... um Chris Pratt you need is, someone, yeah, someone who can embrace the insanity. Yeah, he's the closest thing to like a, a like a, a Hollywood actor, one you would recognize from like the '90s and stuff, who could be funny and uh, both be funny and do the action stuff too. So, I yeah, if if we could get those guys back together to do another one, uh, yeah, it would still be. You'd have to get the right director though. I don't know if John Woo who who would be close to John Woo now. Christ. Uh, no, Matthew, no Vaughn? Vaughn? Doves. Matthew Vaughn. If Matthew Vaughn directed it, it might be good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, Travolta and Cage the dust off their, their trench coats and then we're fine. On their two yeah. Uh, Sarah Jane says, uh, Guys, have you seen Color Out of Space? Drinker, please do a review. I, I've mm. never even heard of that. Color Out of Space. That is a Nick Cage movie, right? Ah, uh, okay. Is that one of the the two hundred movies he's made in the past like five years? Yeah, it's some. It, uh, all like the first thing I think of is purple because like, like fuchsia, and it's got it's some. Uh, a yeah, there's some alien, something alien involved. We'll just say, okay. Uh, and I've seen the trailer for it. And it looks some um, bizarre. That's good enough for me. Um, Mikhail Barejo says, you guys should do the holy trinity of 90s Nick Cage action movies. Face Off, then Con Air, and then The Rock. <laughs> you could, actually, yeah. Um, there's plenty to talk about with all of those movies. Especially The Rock, actually. I really like that film. I love that film. That's one of the things that uh, actually lured me to San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. Not, so. It's like, yeah, because it makes San Francisco look so glamorous. It's so cool. And it was not too long ago. It was, uh, it was a pretty cool place to be. Yeah. The politics were always weird, but, um, before all the human poop on the sidewalks. Yeah. It, it, I mean, you used to be able to go to downtown and like shop. There used to be 
like the Sony Metreon had a giant arcade in it and there was FAO Schwartz and Virgin Megastore and it just had everything. And then uh, the tent companies took over. So there was no reason to go downtown anymore. And in my last two years there, I think I went downtown once and it was just because I was driving through to get somewhere. Uh, and uh, yeah, and so few people have been going down there that you can actually use it as a shortcut now. So uh, yeah, it's it's bad. It's really bad there. I might, I probably do in another, I, that's probably going to be my next video. Of, I was supposed to get a Lord of the Rings. I might get a Lord of the Rings, but my next one's going to be like why I'm leaving California, uh, the place where I thought I'd die and I was born and raised. And I mean, it's cool being down here, you know, where I grew up and stuff, but it's still, it's just nuts here, folks. And I, it's worse in Australia, I know. So I'm with apologies to everyone in Australia uh, who's, who have it way worse than we do. But it's yeah. just going to get better. Yeah. It's like I'm, I'm done with this year. No, yeah. I could just do with like a break from it. <laughs> you right. know, nice. uh, um, we could do like these once, you know, a month or something like that. That would uh, be just fine with me. I love yeah, it. this is this is a nice little break from reality. It's great. Um, there's there's someone in chat has just saying, um, "Hey man, you just fucked up your Ferrari." <laughs> That's from uh, from the Rock. That is when Nicholas Cage just goes like, "It's not mine." <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, that's a good film. Um, Irradiated Salmon. It says, uh, "Speaking of Nick Cage, have you gentlemen seen Leaving Las Vegas?" Uh, yeah, I have about like 15 years ago. It's been ages since I've seen that film. It's not the kind but, of movie you see twice. No, it's it's quite an interesting experience. Uh, Nick Cage is <sighs> Nick Cage in it. Yep. Full on. And uh, one of an Academy Award. And yep. Elizabeth Shue, who I had a, a crush on at one time. Because, uh, you know, she was hot. Uh, yeah, it, but it's, it's sad, but yeah, every, um, uh, they show, um, leaving Las Vegas and movies like that at, at rehabs because, <laughs> you know, uh, they want to show you the dark side and, uh, that's where I saw it. I saw it, uh, in a rehab. So, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, someone in chat has also said driving in San Francisco is like those nightmares where the hill keeps getting steeper and steeper until you fall. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's kind of crazy hills that you've got going on there, isn't it? Like they are insane. They they yeah. did uh, ten years ago. They did a ski jump uh, on one of them because because it was so steep. It was like a like you know ski and the, the the guy skied down and yeah they put a bunch of fake snow. But that yeah the the California street and um you, you saw Venom right so yeah there was a motorcycle jump. I don't know if you remember the motorcycle jump scene. That's a, that's a really steep hill in San Francisco. It's like a block away from my wife's work. Uh, yeah, it's weird. It's, it's, uh, I don't think they would, if they had planned a city now, they wouldn't put it there. It's just, uh, like there's houses on stilts and you know, there's Lombard street, which makes no sense. Uh, it's just like crook. It's the crookedest street in the world. And yeah, it's, it's a very European city. Actually. It's like the only city in America that's actually kind of, European. I went to Italy for the first time two years ago, and you guys over there like to put your towns on top of hills for some reason, maybe because of floods. I don't know, but uh, th there's a bunch of towns like squeezed on these top of like a mountain, and it's like these little streets. Uh, yeah, and that's what San Francisco is kind of like. It, you know, the thing it, is, it, you guys, you guys in America are spoiled because your your cities are basically just giant grids. Yeah, and it's nice and simple, and it's like it's really easy to navigate, and it totally makes sense. But then, like our cities over here are like a thousand years older, and so like all the roads are like designed for horse and carts, like yep. you know, back in the day, and so like they're the to try and incorporate cars into that now, like it's all devolved into like one way systems and crazy like junctions and shit like none of it makes any sense and you the lanes change like every time you get to a, a new set of traffic lights like it's just it's insanity it is but that's, that's what you get used to when you're you know when you're in the uk all your little cars <laughs> your yeah little cars running around <laughs> with like roller skates and i uh, kid you not man honestly the first time i came to florida um like 
10 years ago easily like i was stood next to an suv that was like the size of my fucking house like it was just you know but that's like the standard kind of car size there like uh, yeah it's great (laughs) big old trucks i got a big old car so uh yeah yeah it wouldn't do very well in uh in like london it didn't do that well in san francisco to be honest with you yeah Uh, well Well, like later gasoline over here is like ridiculously expensive you know you fill your you can fill your entire tank up in america with like 20 dollars uh, yeah it's in, not like that here in most cities not in california it's uh it's like 50 bucks here yeah so, yeah yeah i feel yeah. I, um I, that's the one thing i went to london and i'm like oh wow this is there's a there's a city that's more expensive than san francisco holy shit <laughs> so oh, yeah yeah uh, especially drinking in london man that'll sting you um bar drop sorry bar door here says hail critical nerd gary i want to introduce my nephew to comic book spider-man what's a good starting point oh well your nephew i would uh a short answer i would just look up any reprints of um issues 200 and up so there's some Roger Stern stuff if because like every parent wants to tell their kid to read Ultimate Spider-Man now by Brian Michael Bendis. The answer is no, uh, but I don't know if your kid would like the 60s stuff too much. But if you go back into the 80s um, and there's uh, I, I can tell you exactly get uh, Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, it's essential Amazing Spider-Man volume 10. It's cheap. There's a ton of comics in it. It's black and white, but. It's a perfect starter. And, he, you know, depending on how young he is, he can color in it too. So that's, that's, that would be, that's what I started my kid on. And he is a huge Spider Man fan now. So uh, uh, it's available on Amazon. If you, if you go to my Amazon page, uh, if you, if you Google Amazon Nerd Rotic, I have this, uh, this, this page that uh, Melissa set up, my wife, and it's got everything I recommend. And that is on it. So if you go there, you, you can find it. Nice one. Um, Ian Slater here says, found out that Janeway is on Star Trek, Star Trek Prodigy. Star Trek Prodigy? What is that? I've never even heard of that. Is that one here? I have heard of it, but I don't know much beyond the name. Star Trek, uh, Star Trek Voyager actress Kate Mulgrew to reprise iconic role. Here. Oh, wow. This is like... Uh, this is from today. Oh, okay, Prodigy. Yes, that is the um, that is the new animated st- uh, kids one where kids find a starship and uh, uh, a Federation starship and go on adventures, uh, and it's like computer animated. So she's going to be on it, huh? And- so wait, so this is another Star Trek animated show in addition to Lower Decks. Yep. Why? Where Where did this come from? This is um, uh, this comes from the this is going to be on Nickelodeon for one, so it's going to be on a network that kids stopped watching like seven years ago, I think. Uh, and this is supposed to get kids into. Uh, into gosh dang it, that's right. Um, Doctor Who live stream was today on New York Comic Con, um, and I'll have to watch that later. Uh, yeah, that so the, uh, this is brand expansion. So the the whole deal is they bought they they got Alex Kurtzman to take over Star Trek, and they just wanted to make as much of it as they could. They don't really care if it's good or not because they think we're all idiots, basically. I mean, you all watch that boat naked video, right? You saw how the the actors, the adult pretenders, talk to all of us. That's how they think we are. They actually think we're as dumb as they are. Um, so that's that's why we get dumb Star Trek. Uh, and they just want to make more of it, and it's just about quantity and not quality. Yeah, this this is genuinely like throw a bunch of shit against the wall and see what sticks. Yep. You know, they are coming out with everything at the moment. Like they've they've even got um, Strange New Worlds is on the way apparently. Like whether it will get funded or not, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's it's on the way, and this is all we're going to get from Star Trek once they're done with this hot mess. It'll be over for forever. And that's what's sad. Um, the only thing that could save it is if they actually do get rid of Kurtzman and, and then, you know, put put a competent writer on Strange New Worlds. And then I 
I would have an open mind for about it. But uh, if he's involved in any way, it's going to suck. And yeah, yeah it's destroyed it. The the only thing I can think of at this point with Star Trek that would generate interest for me or, or for anyone really would be some kind of epic crossover with all the captains of the, the previous seasons. So bring back Janeway, bring back Cisco, bring back Picard, bring back Archer, fucking bring back Shatner as Kirk if you can get him and, and have them all be involved in some kind of epic crossover mini series where they've got to like put right the, the, um, the space time continuum and restore the original timeline or something and get rid of the Kelvin timeline as a result of doing this, something like that. Like I'm sure you can get people back without too much difficulty. Um, that would be the only that would get me interested. Uh, and and if they could, if that would, if Paramount would do that, like Fire Kurtzman, this is a dream, by the way. And they did that. Uh, that would save Star Trek. Somewhat. Yeah. I, so yeah. uh, Paramount, if you're listening, fire Alex Kurtzman, hire me and Gary. We'll write you a new story and we'll bring back everyone and we'll fix this. Yeah, we I mean, do it. <laughs> we can do it. Right. I mean, he actually knows how to write. So yeah, that would be good. And I'm cheap. I would come cheap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Buy me some more. Oh, man. Honestly, we could like, yeah, even the two of us could come up with, with something better than what they've produced in the past five years. Like just if you give us like a couple of days, we could probably come up with a good story. Yep. That's how bad it is now. Pull in, pull uh, in Doomcock. Get Doomcock and uh, R&B in there, and um, I think that good things could happen. Yeah. Um, Medicaid Child here says, Hey, Drinker, appreciate your channel. Oh, it's given me lots of entertainment and taking the words right out of my mouth, but more articulately, thanks. Thank you. I'm uh, glad you're enjoying my channel, so appreciate it. Um, Pod Racing Palpatine, I have nothing to say, but good luck. We're all counting on you. Yeah. Uh um, and I am being serious. Don't call me Shirley. Uh, Benito Martinez <laughs> Hey Drinker, I ordered your book yesterday Redemption, Ryan Drake, book one I love your channel, figured it was the way to support It really is and I really appreciate it So, uh, you know, all these uh, These people that have been good enough to Buy my books and read them Yeah, like I hope you enjoyed them And, and uh, it really helps me, it's much appreciated So thank you um, Ian Slater 90s movies had a mystique to them They certainly did, and they had CRT Computer monitors, which just made them awesome in my view and discs and people smoking indoors <laughs> right lots of cigarettes lots of cigarettes uh, uh that, yeah I, that you can't even do that now no no that. it's, uh, it's too fun um Oki native uh says uh, she was in lolita i presume that was um the daughter of sean archer who I've forgotten her name again. Damn. But yeah. Apparently she was in Lolita as well. So uh, <laughs> really, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's poetry right there. Uh, yeah. And she's really, is she like, is she really his daughter? I didn't know she was really his daughter. Is she, uh, what was her name again? It was, I just pulled up her IMDb. There she is. Dominique Swain. Swain, yeah. Yeah. Uh, second of three daughters. To, oh, no, she wasn't. I did, uh, so, yeah, she's uh, she's been in a lot of stuff that I've never heard of. Yeah, it's never a good sign. No. Uh, Dive Dodge here says, Drinker, are you reviewing The Boys Season 2? Yes, uh, when we get to the end of it, and I've seen it all. Um, Ian Slater, Face Off or Heat? Damn, man, and that's two very different movies that you're trying to compare there. <laughs> um, he, he's clearly a better movie and like better story, but uh, damn, Face Off is just more fun. Uh, yeah, it is. But he, yeah, he's brilliant, but um, that's crazy. If I was given a choice, I'd probably watch Face Off first because I go for the fun. Yeah, totally. Um, it's kind of like, you know, um, Schindler's List is clearly a far better movie than Armageddon, but I know which one would be more enjoyable to watch, if you know what I mean. Exactly. Uh, 
Bird of Prey here says, Kapla, the Starship Troopers is very underrated in my opinion. Uh, yeah, I think it's gotten more more respect over the years because people have realized what it actually is. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll definitely review it at some point. Uh, Casey McGregor, haven't seen Face Off in forever, must revisit. Check out John Woo's Red Cliff, pretty cool historical epic and the director's cut is five hours long. Ooh. Damn, man. That is, uh, that is hardcore. Uh, yep. Evil Evil Zombie Two, Saving Private Ryan, Dunkirk, and 1917 are all great war movies. But what modern era war movies, if any, have you enjoyed? Oh, modern era war. I mean, movie? 1917 is modern era, isn't it? Yeah. It's only like last year. Yeah, I, I loved 1917. I thought that was a brilliant film. Uh, One of the last ones I saw in a theater too. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I guess it would be that really. Um, there, there's not been a lot of great war movies recently. Um, Hacksaw Ridge was pretty good. I enjoyed that movie. Um, but yeah, like the the World War Two has fallen out of favor a little bit. I think in Hollywood. Um, Stephen Otten says I'm eight chapters into the. F- oh shit! My monitor has just gone out. Hold on. That's okay. Come on, you piece of shit. This is what happens when you use a TV as your monitor. Like, if it sits idle for too long, oh, uh, it just thinks, yeah, it's time to shut down. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, I'm eight chapters into the first Ryan Drake novel, and I'm riding this train to the bitter end. Keep the faith. Thanks, man. Um, hopefully, it's not too bitter for you, um, and I hope you enjoy the, the book, so thanks for buying it. Awesome. Uh, Vinny Rock, is Star Wars dead? Can it be saved? Dead. I can't think of many reasons to save it, really. Um, the Mandalorian's still all right, but like it's not really going to fix the movies. It's yeah, the Mandalorian's like it's a really good distraction. Uh, that's the way I see it. Uh, Star Wars was Luke Skywalker, and it and there was a lot of other stuff that a lot of other hardcore Star Wars fans liked that they decided to get rid of and not tell us the story or tell us it, it piecemeal. So no, I don't think it can. It's uh, it's tough. Because there, I mean, there's still, but God, there's still people hanging on, you know, uh, out there that still talk about it, still love it, and good for them. Bless you. Uh, I'm sorry you're going to have the High Republic to look forward to. <laughs> yeah. Um, let Star Wars die. Kill it if you have to, I would say. Um, Raven K says, Have you ever seen Turbo Kid? Good little post apocalyptic flick. Uh, no, I've never seen it. I've never even heard of Turbo Kid, to be honest. It sounds like a Super Nintendo game. Uh, Turbo Kid. Yeah, I'll look that up later on. Um, Pod Racing Palpatine says, Use duct tape as a mask. It has a light side, a dark side, and it binds the universe together. <laughs> Do it. Yeah. Nothing you can't fix without a bit of duct tape. Um, Finbar Hooli. For an animated film to review, Spirited Away, excellent movie, by um, Hayao Miyazaki is a masterpiece. Yes, it really is. Great film. Um, Yeah. Definitely one to add to the list of of movies to review. I need to review more animated stuff, more animes. Um. Jalen Pulp, sorry, Fulp here says, what's your opinion on the Lost World Jurassic Park? Uh, all right, but kind of pointless. Yeah, it just it didn't inspire that sense of wonder and interest and excitement that Jurassic Park did. It was just, meh, a pretty workmanlike sequel from what I remember. I think it's saw it at the cinema. You know, I haven't seen Jurassic Park. <laughs> I have seen never Jurassic seen Park, the original. I've never, I've never seen the original. Oh, man. Do yourself a favor. You'll enjoy it. Yeah. I, I haven't gotten around to it. I, I will. I, I, I know it. Everybody loves it. I was, uh, when it came out in the theaters, I was um, preoccupied. <laughs> <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't see it. And I never got around to it. It's just one of those things. Uh, but yeah. I will. Take you know if you take something like Jurassic World, um, it's like that, but a million times smarter and original. So yeah, it's definitely a better movie. Um, CP the nerd says I submit Poltergeist for horror review. Hail, yeah, um, I'm totally down with reviewing that movie. Great film. 
Um, Dr. Till, any plans to watch The Good Lord Bird? Was skeptical, but ended up pleasantly surprised. Um, that's another one I've never even heard of. No. Have you? No, I have not. Good Lord Bird. Nah. Um, well, um, Tannen loves his axe. I don't know what's sorry, I don't know about where you live, but I just saw The Empire Strikes Back in my local theater. It was great because I'm only 26 and missed the good stuff. Yeah, uh, I take it that's that thing of like theaters showing old movies just to keep themselves going. In which case, yeah, that'd be cool as fuck. Yeah, yeah, it's playing near me. Yeah, that must be a different experience uh, seeing them on the big screen. Um, Am Raphael says, Hail, have either of you seen the cover of Space? And if so, what did you think? Uh, yeah, I think we covered that earlier, actually. Uh, no, I don't think either of us have seen it, so can't comment on it. Um, Darth DJ, uh, did you know the Pluto TV is pushing CBS All Access to the max? I yeah. thought they were changing to Paramount Plus. They are. Uh, right. They're just pushing it to the max till it's over with because... Uh, all access was such a success with star trek they had to rebrand it and yeah well it's it just yeah it's logical isn't it mm -hmm. um everyone was dying to watch discovery uh <laughs> men's machines uh gave me a super sticker thanks for that um ends beginning says drinker and friends could you make an awesome picard season two plots while leaving season one uh what could i come up with a plot for season two that wouldn't be shit uh pfft. No, <laughs> I, I don't know where I could take it from this point. Picard's been ruined as a character. I mean, it, I guess you could try and have him rediscover his like uh, balls somewhere in his decaying robot body. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's just. Oh, it's so dumb. I, I, I would probably just give people what they really want, and it's basically a TNG reunion. And have them like, reform as a crew on a starship and go and do a mission somewhere. Like that's just all anyone really wanted. They didn't give a shit about any of the new characters because they weren't interesting. Um, but yeah, I know they'll never do that because that would be too kind to the fans. Um, Astro Zombie says, "Where would you rank uh, Face Off in John Woo's filmography?" Um, I mean, I haven't seen a lot of his earlier stuff, so I couldn't speak to that. But I would put it in in the top, the the upper tier of John Woo films because it's just fun, and that factors in. That actually helps with me a lot. Anyway, uh, makes me forgive a lot of things. Yeah, but yeah, I haven't seen everything either. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I would consider it like hard boiled, probably one of his best to me. Anyway. Uh, but as far as American stuff, for sure, it's it's right up there, if not the best. Yeah, uh, we've only got a couple more to go, actually, and then we're all done. Um, Richard Kalergi, uh, what do you think about the fact that the ethnic English, Scottish, Welsh and Irish will be ethnic minorities in their own homelands by 20, 2066? Um, yeah, I think this is based on projections of like, you know, reproduction rates and stuff like that and and migration uh, i don't know i mean uh, it'd be kind of shit to think that it would come to something like that where you're a minority in your own country but uh who knows um I, I don't have a crystal ball for like 40 years into the future sadly um but yeah i, I would hope we would progress and by that time Eth uh, ethnicities wouldn't be that big of a deal to anyone we just treat each other as individuals and kind of a, a star trek approach to that at least uh that we'd uh at least not as far as the system but it's how we treat each other uh and and i'll be dead by then <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah look on the bright side eh? <laughs> um What's the next one? Stephen Otten here says, 2020, written by Stephen King and directed by Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> Honestly, I think 2020 has been directed by Tommy Wiseau. Uh, I think that's, that's where we're at at this point. It's just insanity. The Stephen uh, King writing part, though. <laughs> that's yeah. Pretty, pretty spot on. <laughs> that's, it. that's good. Uh, Viva J here says, Honeyman in Vegas, uh, Nick Cage plays a flying Elvis. Real life, he marries Lisa Marie Presley. Yeah, he does. Um, he's had a right obsession with Elvis, so he did. 
Um, yeah. He was the yeah. second Superman. That's why he called his son Kal El. And that's who he sold his uh, his uh, comic collection uh, during that marriage for some reason. Yeah. He probably he tried, it back. Well, he tried so hard to get that Superman movie off the ground as well. Mm -hmm. It was like Superman Lives or something it was going to be called. Yep. God, it would have been terrible. <laughs> yeah. so well, apparently I it's going to tie into this sort of Val Kilmer, George Clooney, um, Batman sort of series of movies. Yep. So that would have been a shared cinematic universe with Nick Cage as Superman. God damn. Like the mind boggles. Yeah, in the early days of that, uh, um, Keaton was still in the picture, and he was supposed to. There was rumors of him making a cameo, making some speech as Bruce Wayne or something like that. Um, but that all went to hell. Yeah, but that shows you that Warner Brothers has been able to do this for years. They could have done a shared universe with Christopher Reeve if they wanted to, but uh, they didn't because they didn't. They they've never known what to do with their own characters. <clears throat> um, swinging cod here says the opening sequence to the salt and sea is a high water mark in american cinema yep um, gianni greco here says drinker a discussion of they live would not only be great for a blow by both fight commentary but also an insight into the cultural climate we are living in today uh yeah once you put those glasses on you see things for how they really are then you get a different view of the world um, Canadian Spider-Man. Is there an app that shows me other subscribers in a pub? Uh, if there's not, then there should be. Uh, that would be cool. Um, activated Complex. Star Trek Legacy did the Captain's crossover thing really well. Uh, pretty good Trek game, really. Anyway, thanks for the stream. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've not played Legacy, so I, I couldn't tell you. Um, but it would just be, it would be great to see all the captains on screen. And I think most of them are pretty, pretty cheap acting wise. So you could probably get them on board without too much difficulty. Yep. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to do a drinker fixes Star Trek. That's what I'll do. I'll write my, my storyline. Um, Lady Gravemaster, Demolition Man or Commando for movie night. Oh, I'm going to say Commando. Go old school. That's tough. Demolition Man is so topical these days. Uh, uh, you go with Commando. I mean, with, it's tried and true. Demolition Man's great, though. I'd yeah. say one on it. With Commando, you've got Arnold Schwarzenegger fighting a tubby middle-aged man. So, um, yeah, that's just that's just great. Um, Swinging Cod here says, The Great Raid about a POW camp liberation during the reinvasion of the Philippines is a decent war movie. Not great uh, PV, but good cast and story. Uh, the Great Raid. That must be an old one, I assume. I've never heard of it. No. Oh. Uh, but yeah, keep, keep an eye out for that. Oh. Um, Mr. V says, how have my two favorite YouTube drunks, Drinker and Cecil, not streamed together yet? What madness is this? Uh, he's not not approached me, so I wasn't really aware that that would be something he'd want to do. But uh, my door's always open. Oh, I'm sure you would. Uh, Robert Wang. I hate to be pessimistic, but The Mandalorian Season 2 will end up like Westworld Season 2. I'm calling it. Um, it depends how much involvement Kathleen Kennedy had, I think. Mm -hmm. it's come down to her um, i don't think john favreau is down with any of that crap so it's it's going to be on her um, that would be interesting jalen folk here says drinker what's your opinion on the lost world jurassic park novel don't know i've only read the original jurassic park novel i haven't read the sequels or anything like that so i couldn't tell you i'm afraid uh i think i think that's the last of the super chats actually let me just refresh uh, oh yeah, there's one more here uh, from LT Netjack. Here says the Roundhead wrote 2020 to subvert our expectations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well he certainly did because I expected this year to be good and it's been shit. So he he subverted the the hell out of my expectations there. Yep. Ugh. Um. Yeah. Just uh, I'm going to draw a line under 2020. Just move on from it. Yeah, uh, I think this is the. We can one we can write off. Let's let's just pretend this year didn't happen. That's that's going to be good. That's the better way to do it. You know what? Just yeah, keep it in mind to appreciate. Like if if 
things go back to normal, hopefully they will. It's completely up to us uh, that we remember that and maybe enjoy some freedoms a little more. Yeah. Uh, but that brings us to the end of the Super Chats, uh, which effectively, I guess, brings us to the end of our live stream. So, man, it's been an adventure tonight. Um, it's been awesome to relive this movie. And, uh, you know, honestly, I, I thanks to you, Gary, for recommending this one because it's been years since I've seen Face Off all the way through. And it was just an absolute pleasure to watch. I had an absolute ball with it. And it's been great to discuss this film with you tonight. <laughs> it has been brilliant and a blast. And uh, hopefully we can do it again. We'll pick another movie. Uh, cause I love doing these. So th this is, uh, it's, it's nice to take it. It almost, it feels like a day off <laughs> so, yeah. um, with all the, yeah. So it's great. Thanks again for having me on. It's an honor, my friend. That is a pleasure. And, uh, thanks to everyone in chat. You guys have been great. Thank you for all the super chats. It's all very much appreciated. I really appreciate your generosity. Thanks to everyone who's bought a copy of my book. Um, I hope you enjoy that. And, uh, yeah, I guess we'll catch you again for the next one. But for this evening, that is all we've got for today. So we're going to go away now. <laughs>